Everybody's waiting. Hello, everyone. How's it going? I uh, need to wipe my lens. It's a little greasy. Hold on one second. Get to watch me wipe face grease off. Face less face greasy. Ah, uh, probably should do my glasses while I'm at it too. This is what I look like without glasses, everyone. Hope everyone's having a good week. I don't normally do two weeks in a row, but I gotta finish this display for IMOMA anyways, so I might as well just include you guys in the process. So, thanks for being here. Thanks for everybody who's here already. I know I'm starting the streams at six. I just need a little bit more time uh, as I prepare for IMOMA when I have time in my days off to work on stuff for IMOMA. So, I said IMOMA not enough times, I think, already. <laughs> Hope everybody's doing good. Um, I wanted to start the stream off by staining something that I was working on uh, yesterday with you guys, and then I pulled out some materials to do a few different wall types, accent wall types. Um, hopefully we have time for at least two more, if not three, and we can uh, wrap up the painting of these, and I'll explain to you the, the color uh, that I laid onto the blue wall. If you looked at my posts, I took the MDF and wood wall that we did the 45 degree angle lines on last week and I painted it a really, really rich aquamarine dark blue with some shadows and there will be highlights that will pop when I sand it down, uh, which will be later because I painted another layer before I came on stream. So anyways, this is actually something that I made yesterday. This is a miniature coffee table that I made. What's up, Sharon and Zamboni? Uh, and this is actually made, so this veneer that I made is actually made of stacked tongue depressors or popsicle sticks, large popsicle sticks, or you know, the at, say, ah, uh, tongue depressors. I stacked them together, glued them together, clamped them together, um, and let them dry, and actually made multiple things out of this one sheet of clamped material that I made. Um, you'll see one of those in a reel in a couple of weeks, or in a short in a couple of weeks, um, and some thin miniature plywood made from basswood, and some dowel rod. So you can see it's popsicle stick veneer with uh, plywood around it, plywood around the sides, plywood on the bottom, dowel legs, um, dowels, and little more popsicle sticks. Well, it's actually not popsicle sticks, it's actually uh, basswood lumber miniature basswood lumber, but it's all the same material. And so I just finished this and I wanted to stain it. Um, I'm gonna stain it, sand it, stain it, and sand it, and then seal it. So we'll do the first staining tonight. I'm gonna use this Minwax Wood Finish Ebony, because uh, I don't, I want it to look really, really sort of like dark burnt uh, without actually having to burn it, because you could do that. You could burn it, sand it, burn it, finish it. That looks nice too. But this is a light, soft wood. I wanted to stain it and sand it, uh, to give it an aged, sanded, aged, aged stain look. That's the words I'm looking for. Um, so anyways, and this thing is like solid too. It's like, that top is actually that thick. That's not just the siding. It's actually that thick. So you could actually, I could probably stand on this if I wanted to, but I don't want to break it. So, um, and yeah, let me show you guys how that um, rusty wall turned out, a rusty wall, found object wall that we're going to make rusty turned out. So this is what we did on stream, and I added these wires after the stream. And that's all that is. That's just wire bent and shaped and glued into place with pliers. So, and I just painted the whole thing with like two and a half coats of flat black as the base. And honestly, like, would love to just do a whole diorama of like hallways with this and put figures in front of them. This would be a great background for figure reviews, in fact, I may make something like this for some future figure reviews. But I pulled out some paints. I don't know if you can, and you can't see them. We're gonna use on this. We're gonna spray a few different colors of oranges and reds, and then we'll let that get to where it's almost dry, and then we'll sort of sponge on and stipple on some brighter oranges and washes. And I don't know if we'll have time for every single layer tonight, because we have to wait for some things to kind of cure and dry. But um, we'll, we should get close and then we can, you know, this one, this one will probably take the most out of all the walls we did just because of the painting process and the stacking of textured items. But this was the theme I was going for, which was a lots of texture, not sticking out too far. Um, and uh, so it creates a really, really nice visual with lots of interest. 
with, in my opinion, minimal effort. Like obviously we put effort into this. This took like an hour and a half to make, but it looks like it took a lot longer than that. So you can really create beautiful textures, beautiful industrial looks. Somebody mentioned cyberpunk, uh, look, steampunk, cyberpunk, diesel punk, all the punks. Um, so you can make back walls to buildings or futuristic alleyways with this. I love this type of building, this found object, um, you know, greeblies or found objects or um, obtainium, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call this stuff. If you've got found objects that are, that, that fit your theme. And I've got two little shelves that I created out of those metal pieces to put items on now. So that's, that's the whole purpose of these. These are slidable walls. I'm going to put in my display that I can display things in front of for sale. And I can put items. I made some, um, actually, let me grab something. I made some really cool miniature decor. Uh, it's over here. Let me go grab that and show you the types of things I'm talking about. So I still got to put like little hangers on these, but I was making like little Hobby Lobby miniature decor this week. So I like I made like a little Battlestar Galactica sign that you could hang in the bedroom, you know. So there's a little sign you could put up on the shelf. You could put a plant there. Oops, if I hold it straight. Put a plant there, you know. You could put a lamp. You could put a, a sign, a family photo. I made these little decorative wall hanging things too. So you can put them, you know, like that with like little phrases, live, laugh, love, <laughs> or whatever, you know. Um, but anyways, that's the kind of, I'm gonna create, try to create a lot of different styles uh, uh, to, uh, to display the different styles of things I created. So that's the whole point of why we're doing this. Let me show you that blue wall really quick too. <clears throat> It looks like it's almost to the point of where I could sand it, but this is the wall that we did last week with the paint on it. And so I did two coats of flat black on this, and then I did one coat of this sort of rich, dark aquamarine, and then I actually sprayed a very, very light coat of a almost purpley, pale robin's egg blue in between those first layers and this layer that I just did before the stream. Because what I did before the stream was I hit it with another thin layer of flat black and then another layer of that blue. And I did it on purpose so it was a little uneven. You can see so, some sort of, you can see there's some sort of black and dark tones and gradients going on, um, almost shadows too, like under some of these edges. I Apparently there's a name for that technique. It's something I discovered when I was a kid, just painting stuff, but it's like called a xylenthal highlight or something like that, or a low light. I don't know. I've been doing it like my whole life and apparently there's a name for it, but I create, I like to paint in shadows and highlights and I did that on this piece um, as I did with like the whole tiny art experiment is painted that way with three layers of spray paint to create highlights and low lights and shadows and stuff like that. So anyways, this, when this is dried enough, I'm gonna take a very, very, very high grit sandpaper to this, probably like 400 sandpaper, and very lightly rub over this whole piece and create uh, where it will peel off some of this paint and expose a little bit of the lighter color. And in some other areas where I sand a little harder, it'll expose some of the black. So uh, it'll create a bunch of sort of contrast and variation and saturation and tone across the whole piece. Now, you don't have to do any of that. You could just paint it a nice, pretty solid color. But, you know me, I like to kind of go overboard. So <laughs> that's what I'm gonna do. I'll probably do it like on these areas to highlight the lines over here and maybe on the edges mostly. And then I'll decide if I wanna go into the open areas. But that's that's my intention with this, right? So you can imagine a dining table and a lamp or, and a, um, a chandelier, a dining table, some seating maybe a, a, a floor lamp, something like that in front of this wall. Actually, <laughs> I shared uh, an image from a, a woodworker who does these accent walls in real life and in, in full size in real life uh, next to this on my Instagram story and he saw it and he followed me and he said, hey, this is really awesome. He ended up following me. So that was really cool. Um, so the, the full size world is merging with the miniature size world. So I'm gonna set this back over here in front of the fan so it will cure more and hopefully I can try to show you that before the end of the stream. And I cut a bunch of wood planks from scrap wood I had at 10 inches to start another wall and I tested a color, that's coral. Really beautiful color that I like. 
Um, I might paint this wall that color or not. I might sand it. I might, I don't know what I'm gonna do. But this is all coated wood, it's pre-painted. So uh, we're, I'm gonna score the center line in all these. So this is the same piece here. I just scored this side so it would look like um, sort of Quaker style vertical boards. So we're gonna score these and drag a all an all through it. Well, it's a hole punch, but an all through it to create a divoted ridged edge. And then I'll probably sand these edges a little bit. And then once it's glued down, I'll probably sand the whole thing, paint it and sand it again, and then see what I wanna do, if I like that look or not. But I'm just trying to think of ways with scraps and things I have around the shop, things that you can do too, uh, to create visual interest in these interesting looking accent walls. I also, right before the stream, uh, cut down all of these tongue depressors um, or craft sticks um, at 45 degree angles on both ends. <laughs> Anyways, at 45 degree angles on both ends. Didn't mean to do that. Um, Should have just done this. So that we can stack them up and create an interesting looking, maybe uh, almost like flooring, but put up on a wall and go at an angle or just go straight up and down. I haven't decided, but I cut a bunch of this. So I hope this is enough to cover the whole uh, wall. We'll find out. And I wanted to cut, oh, I'll have to go grab some, but I wanted to cut open some um, um, uh, comic book backer boards to create trim. And we can cut that in two layers. And that's probably the one I'll do last because uh, it's gonna take the most time and I wanna show the most things I can here on this stream. So I'll probably do that one last. But I think we have time for all the all three of these tonight. So let me grab some paper towels for the staining and some cardboard underlayment here. Could probably just use this. This is what we were spraying the glue on last week. And I'm gonna have to get some gloves. Let me get some gloves here. Hold on. I'll say hi to everyone in the chat in a minute. I just want to get the stream going. If it was a larger piece, I would just brush on the, the um, stain, but because I think this will fit in the can, I'm gonna dip it into the can and pull it out probably a couple times and just let it drain. I might wipe it, uh, depending on how heavy the stain sits on it. So I'm gonna grab my microfiber cloth for wiping, and I'm gonna use a piece of wire here. It's just some baling wire I had lying around to dip it into the stain. visual ASMR for this dream. And what was I just about to grab? Oh yeah. Flathead screwdriver for the can. Let me flip this around. Well, let me say hi to whoever's here. Hold on a sec. 27 people watching and 14 likes. Thank you so much, everybody. I see people talking before the night started. Michael Dumas, Troy Dodson, Nightwolf 3176, Joy Toys 93, what is up? New Future Customs, White Vegeta, Sharon Zamboni, Eric Bradshaw. Uh, I wish I had more options on mobile here. Fat Red Foo, what is up? What is up on all of our, uh, anybody who's a newcomer or a lurker? Thank you for lurking. Thank you for newcoming. Thank you for being here. Feel free to ask any questions if I have a chance to see them I will answer them but uh, everybody can talk back and forth and the channel members and workshop masters got to see some of the behind the scenes pics after last week's stream uh, that I shared um, so they kind of knew I was doing this color stuff already a little bit so thank you to all the channel members who are here let me flip this down and we'll get to it here So this is just the ebony Minwax wood finish stain. I've had this for years. I just keep shaking it up and it keeps working just fine. It takes me a long time to go through stain. I really don't, I don't, since I don't do a lot of full size stuff, it takes me a long time to go through stain. There it is. So hopefully I don't spill this everywhere and ruin everything. All right, I'm just going to see if I can, let's see, will this fit? Yes, it will. Back you guys up here. I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to do this. 
something. I do this. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to see if that'll work. Nope. Just bending some wire. See if I can get this to do what I want. If not, I will just hold it. I'm just trying to see if I can do it without it. Without having to hold it into the stain just to minimize the mess. All right, let's just try a hook. Probably should have started simple instead of going complex off the bat. Okay. Yeah, the hook was a better idea. <clears throat> uh, Try to center this in the camera for the most dramatic effect. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, the wall is flat black, if you were wondering. I don't know if it looks gray on camera, but it's flat black. So we just shaking this to make sure it's not going to fall off. Okay. Let's see how badly this goes. <laughs> dun, 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 Ooh. Stain. Probably gonna have to push it down anyways. That's okay. Yep, there it is. I'm gonna hold it in there for like three seconds, well, like 10 seconds. Mmm, I love the smell of oily chemicals. Not really. There we go. Sweet. All right, sweet. I'm gonna flip this over here too and let it drain from the other way. There we go. Fabulous. Okay, I'm just gonna set this down on the paper towel. <clears throat> Put the lid back on carefully so I don't splatter stain everywhere. might do this twice depending on how light this turns out as it dries. I don't know. So it's amazing what you can do with cheap and simple materials like I did out of this as I described, but it does take time. This took quite a bit of time to make. Um, in fact, I made this top like a couple of months ago and couldn't figure out how I wanted to use it. Then I finally figured out how to use it. Then I trimmed all the sides and glued them, let that dry. Then I had to do the table lay that I just yesterday for many hours I worked on the surrounding base and legs the top took like was like one thing a couple months ago another thing a couple of weeks ago and then the base was like several hours of work yesterday so there's like I don't know probably six hours seven hours of time into this over the course of many months a little bit of the time and all of the tables like that I'm taking to IMOMA and all the miniature furniture is kind of like that so I will be pricing things accordingly while I'm there because it's amazing. People see a little miniature piece of furniture and they go, oh, that's worth 20 bucks. And it's like, well, if I really measure my time out, <laughs> uh, it actually took a lot longer than that. And I'd be doing a discredit to myself and to other artists. So don't underprice yourself. So let me see here. It's looking pretty good. I like it. Let me just grab this and I'm going to... Just kind of wipe everything around evenly here. And get some of the bubbles off. Leaving bubbles on there and stuff can mess up the finish and kind of make it not look like you want. It sounded like a bunch of turkeys were outside. Maybe it's dogs. Sound like a bunch of turkeys outside. I don't know if you guys can hear that on the camera. Literally sounds like there's turkeys outside. That's weird. Look at that. That's actually already looking really cool. And with the popsicle stick 
dowel materials and stuff that I've gone with, you're gonna get a more inconsistent finish because it's cheaper materials, it's thinner wood, it's meant for crafts. That's actually what I wanted with this though, so keep that in mind. If you want a more perfect, consistent finish, you might have to buy a more expensive piece of wood and pre-treat it with like, there's pre-stained materials or, or uh, like oils and dips and stuff where you can dip it, dry it, and then once you stain it, the stain will, will spread more evenly throughout the piece. Uh, but on this one, I intentionally want it to look uneven. Um, I'm going for that look, so. Actually, this is looking pretty good. I don't know if I'm gonna need to do a second coat, but I won't really know until it's completely dry, which technically won't be till tomorrow. I'll be able to get an idea of it by the end of the stream, but I really won't know what it's gonna look like till tomorrow. So I'm just moving this piece around and rubbing it to make sure there isn't a bunch of excess liquid and oil inside of it. Um, because that can warp things and it can prevent things from curing evenly and that's not what I want, so. And if you notice, like, some of it's from my fingers, but some of it, as I'm moving it around, it seeps back through the popsicle sticks. Seems to be clearing up finally, though. Getting some coming back through there. And when it's th you stop seeing the shiny, that's when you've pretty much cleared it up. On a full-size piece, you wouldn't have to do this this much. You probably could just do like wipe it, let it sit, and then wipe it down and be fine. But because it's so small, it's got all these little crevices that are moving. And or it's uh, seeping all over the place. Seeping is the word I was thinking of. Okay. So the underside, some of these spots like right here, um, that's where there's either an imperfection in the wood, a chemical stain, or glue got. So like right there, right up in here, right there, that's like glue or chemical staining or bleach from the wood cleanup process, however they did that at the plant where they made all the craft sticks. But again, I want that on this piece. Actually, this is looking really nice the way that it is. <clears throat> I'm pretty, like, see over here like that. I like that though, it's adding character for me for what I'm going for here. If I wanted it to be even, I'd probably paint it Instead of stain it, I'd probably paint it with a really, really, I'd probably take some watered down acrylic and do like two or three layers of watered down acrylic to get this to look more even. But this looks, it looks really, really, really cool in person. It's almost like a obsidian gray and the wood is almost looking like a tan pearlescent highlight. That's pretty cool looking. Pretty happy with that. It smells amazing too. It's bad that I love the smell of wood chemicals. <laughs> okay, that looks pretty good. We'll see what that looks like when it dries. I might need a, a second very light coat, depending on how much this lightens up, but this might be good too. Oh, there's another little leak. Cool. Don't want all that on my fingers or that. Yippee. Uh, and a uh, word of caution too, if you do a lot of this staining or you decide to do this, don't crumple a bunch of rags like this up and throw them in the trash can and let them sit there. Uh, that's how actual, some chemicals, because of the off-gassing, especially with wood treating chemicals, stains, solvents, they can light each other on fire. So I'm gonna take these and I'm gonna like lay them out flat and let them dry some more before I throw them away. Just a caution, because I've actually been in shops where smoke has occurred in trash cans and I've seen fires occur in other videos and things like that where people have made mistakes, so just, be careful, these solvents and these things that are in this wood, even though they're natural, can start fires if they're kept in a confined place uh, or they let off too much gas and create like a chemical reaction, you know, to themselves. So just be careful. Uh, let me just, actually, I'm gonna leave this on here to dry. I'm just gonna set this whole thing aside. This I'm gonna lay out flat. I don't know where, probably over there. I'm gonna set this by the fan over here. Let's put that right there. The gloves I'm gonna go ahead and throw away because they're no good to me anymore.
White Vegeta, that's good. I'm glad you were talking about that. A lot of people don't think about how much time they spend making stuff and cut themselves short. And then they get upset and because they're not making any money for the time they're putting into things. So don't do that. It's a disservice to yourself and to the entire community of creators. So don't do what Donnie Don't does. Yeah, so... Yeah, uh, figure out how, like, in actual hours, what time, how, how long things took and what the cost of materials is. If it's, you know, if it's negligible, like it's a couple dollars, then you can ignore it. But, you know, if you're spending, you know, for me, sometimes I spend $300 on a gallon of resin that I, I, I use it on many things, but it's very expensive and the prices are always going up. So on some of these miniature tables I'm using, I'm using like five bucks worth of resin on a little, little tiny piece of, piece of miniature table, you know, so... And maybe it only took me an hour to make uh, some of the easier ones, but some of the harder ones might have taken me 12 hours to make. And if I charge even minimum wage for 12 hours, it's like, it's not even worth it, you know? Like, that's, I might as well just go go get a regular job or go get a job, you know, uh, at minimum wage because <laughs> it's just not worth doing. So, you know, take that into consideration if you make things to sell. Don't cut yourself short just to get your name out there. Value your time. Don't be a jerk to people, but... Value your time. Okay, let's see if we can make this look even prettier. <clears throat> so, I've got Cinnamon Satin um, by Rust-Oleum. I use a lot of Rust-Oleum paints. I just really like the way they feel and look. This is Satin Fire Orange. These are all colors I've used for rust before. That's why I'm pulling them out. This is Satin Espresso for the sort of dried, burnt rust that's sort of like done. And Colonial Red, I'll throw this in. You can use, I use, there's a red oxide that I really like too. I just am out of it. It's brighter than this, but it's almost, it looks like rust on its own. Like the ready, the red rush, rust, I can't even say the word, the red rust, uh, um, rusty red looks just like rust. That's why it's called that. It's great. The Colonial Red looks good, especially when you combine it with these oranges. <clears throat> so I like to do at least three colors on something if I can. Uh, to create multiple tones. If I'm trying not to do something that's a flat color, if I wanted to have interest, I try to do three colors, something dark, something light, and one or two in between um, for the main color usually makes things pop. <clears throat> and then things I'm gonna use as textural elements, I have Spiced Berry, this cheap Walmart paint, but it works great for stuff like this. Um, it's sort of the acrylic equivalent of colonial red and then any of these bright oranges work great this is pumpkin orange i also have jack-o-lantern and something else these are great to stipple on and look like fresh rust and create like patches of sort of dark to light and light to dark and then i will probably go back at the end when all this is dry and do some little silver highlights with like a chrome or a metallic silver paint just very little bits on a few edges just like like it got rusty and somebody came by and scraped it, you know, and I'll do like probably on like the edges of the shelves here and then like I'll dry brush a little bit up here and like this edge will get some silver and maybe these pipes and stuff like that and I'll, I'll directionalize it where I'll like drag it down or like at an angle like somebody walked by and like their shoulder swiped it or something. Not a lot, very little, a little goes a long way. And then I'll go over the whole thing with like a dark brown or a black wash and that will tie everything together. So you've got highlights, low lights, thick rust, light rust, metal scrapes and all that stuff. If you were to, if you happen to do your bottom layer of texture in all metal, that's bare metal, you can just sand it off instead of painting silver, which is I love to do. If I ever have the chance to make something out of actual metal, paint it and then sand it off, then you have real metal showing through and it looks even better. But in this case, I only have that like here and here on some of the wires. So I might do that. We'll see. So first thing I have to do is spray down some of the spray paint. And I'm just going to do that right here. <clears throat> With you guys on the camera. Just using a brush, a chip brush I have to make sure there is no sitting clumps of dust on this that are going to get embedded into the paint which it's fine if it does i can fix it but i would like to have to minimize fixing things of course if possible so i'm going to start with the darkest color first 
which is this espresso. And I'm gonna paint where I want shadows or where I want things to be dark. Really simple. The black's already there, but I'm gonna add a different color for the shadow as well as the black. So I'm gonna maybe think about painting under, like I'm gonna paint this whole bottom, une and I'm gonna do it unevenly on purpose. Like I'm not gonna make it a thick spray of espresso satin. I'm gonna kind of randomly, but make sure I get paint moving to a certain area, like up under here and under here and under here, and maybe in some of these wider areas or areas I think would look good as big color massings of dark, you know? I'm just gonna hold this. <clears throat> Don't be afraid, just go for it. You can always paint it flat black again if you don't like what you did. Pretty easy. I think I'm happy with that already. You guys can see that. It's a little glossy because the paint's fresh, but it's already got some interest to it. Maybe I'll do a little bit more under here. Sometimes, too, picking some highlight spots and starting to amass color, like I'm just spraying some, some color in some of these areas, like right in here, in between this line and this line, and right in here, between this line and this line that are already defined in this sort of open area, 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 in this area, just to create spots of visual interest. And again, I can add or delete it as I layer other colors. If it's if you laid it on really thick and it's still really wet, you might wanna wait, but I like working in thin spray layers because it dries quicker and I can keep adding more paint, which is what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna pull out that Colonial Red now. This is a gloss Colonial Red. For rust, I recommend going with satin or flat, but this, when I went to go get this, it didn't originally come in a flat. It's a gloss, and that's okay, because I'm gonna add water washes to it at the end that will sort of delete the gloss and take it away. Gloss takes longer to dry, which is normally don't like to use gloss, but in this case, I'm just gonna kind of roll with it, because that's what I have. <clears throat> and you can, but gloss just takes longer to dry, and if you lay it on too thick, it takes forever to dry. And it's annoying, it drives me insane. I only like gloss paint for like finished metal works, you know, like a model cars or like if I'm trying to do a clean spaceship or something like that, <clears throat> or a highlight. I don't really like using gloss for a lot. I like satin flat and if I wanna add a gloss, I'll do a clear layer of gloss, you know? I don't know, I just feel like I have more control over the paint that way. So I'm gonna actually hold this farther away from me now and do sort of the same thing. But I'm gonna, but I'm holding it farther away, so the spray is gonna get out a lot farther than the espresso, and more evenly. And now I'm gonna gonna go down, because I want it to look like it's come down and rusted it, like water's dripped down and rusted it. And if I angle it down, all the stuff I did before will have uh, shadows coming upward on the piece, and that's already looking pretty good, actually, like that. I'm kind of happy with that. I don't know if I want to add any more. I think I'm gonna leave that alone. I'm happy with that the way that it is. I love you just the wall you are. Okay. Now I've got two different colors here. The cinnamon, it's funny because on the caps, the cinnamon actually looks, unless I switch the caps, you know what I probably did. I think I did. Yep, switch the caps. Ha <laughs> ha! So the cinnamon is more nutmeggy brown and the orange is more like a really rich orange. I want this to come out last because this is gonna be the pop. So I'm gonna go with the brown. <clears throat> Make sure you shake your spray paint really good before you use it, especially if it's sitting around for a long time. The flat spray paint I used on this was sitting around for a long time and I forgot how long it had been sitting around and I shook it up a lot, but then it came out in like a big glop and ruined the cap. I had to switch the cap. So it didn't ruin my paint job, but it ruined my cap. So I don't want to ruin anything. Oops, and this needs a cap. Steal this one. Switch caps all the time. Starting to smell like paint. 
So you guys see the natural shadows being created on this? Like it's a little hard to see on camera, but it's got a lot of, there's a lot of tones in here already, black, brown, and red. Now we're gonna add a cinnamon. Same thing, I'm gonna stay back, but now I'm gonna pick spots. Instead of being a little bit more even like I was with the red, because I wanted it to kind of give the whole thing a rust theme, I'm gonna stand back and choose where I want the rust to be more prominent a little bit, but I'm gonna keep it far away so that it gradiates out a lot more evenly. <clears throat> And I don't mind, so you'll see splatters at this stage. Uh, I don't mind that <clears throat> because it looks like little spots of rust forming. So I don't mind that. Maybe a little bit too orange right there. That's okay. Can tone it back down later. Some splatters, that's good. So what I'll do is like, if I get a little bit more splatters in certain areas that I want or more orange, like here's a little bit more orange than I meant to right there, a little bit of a splatter right there. I'll turn that into a crusty, rusty spot. I'll turn that, I'll darken that back up when I add like these colors, right? So I won't try to fix it with spray paint because I'm gonna overdo it and mess everything up right now. So if I pull the Colonial Red out and try to fix it, it actually might mess up what I'm doing here and, and mess all of it up. So I'll go back over this with the brushed on paint and the sponging, and this I'll turn into like a crusty spot. So I'll let some of the imperfections that naturally form inform what I'm gonna do later, and then it's like a much less stressful process. So <clears throat> I see you guys commenting, hold on. Get the orange out. Uh, yeah, you can put them in hot water. I don't know about that, though, because it's, like, it's going to heat up the air molecules. It depends on what you're doing, you know? I guess that could that work. I'm so used to doing it this way, Troy, that I'm just going to probably stick with it. But, um, but, uh, yeah, if you heat them up uh, in hot water, that's definitely a trick you can use. <sighs> do, 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 do. Thank you, Eddie. Okay. <clears throat> everyone's going to have their own way of doing a lot of this nobody's wrong please keep that in mind nobody's wrong and nobody's right everybody it's all correct so whatever you like to do that works for you that you're happy with and if you combine other techniques that's the right technique for you so i'm just showing you my way Intentionally want it to be darker at the top to create a shadow. That I'm pretty darn happy with. And this did the exactly what I wanted. It got that really floppy flop sweat spray. So okay, that I'm pretty darn happy with that. So <clears throat> I'm gonna set this behind the fan and let this dry because I think this is this looks thin enough to where we can work with it um, some more. So I'm going to set this over by the fan with the other blue wall, let that dry, and we'll start gluing another thing. So, <clears throat> Eddie, this is not cardboard. Well, this bottom is cardboard. But this is MDF board. It looks like this when it's not painted. And it is a million other things. You'll have to watch last, streak's, last week's stream to see all the stuff I added, but it's styrene and cardboard and nails and wire and nuts and cardboard and dowels and pvc sheet and washers and i think that's it. some metal pieces i think that's it so it looks so pretty look at that see there's the splatters on there so let me show you eh, i don't know if i want to do it on this but something you can do while this is still dry if you wanted to, I'll just do a little bit right here. You can take a brush with that's just dry and you can drag it down. If it'll let me do it. Yeah. 
and you can create a downward smear or a directional smear. It's doing it a little bit. It's hard to see on camera, but it's creating a directional smear to make it look like the rust has formed very slowly as moisture has accumulated and drips down. Okay, yeah, it's, it's doing it. It's just taking a little bit of force. Okay, so you can see there, the rust has almost a downward slope. Well, it's not perfectly circular splatter. This side, it's a little bit more circular. It's very hard to see on this camera, sorry. It's a little bit more circular splatter here. Over here, it's got a downward trajectory. So actually, I like the way that turned out. This is at the perfect stage, so I'm gonna do it before it cures too much. Let's see if I can show you guys. I'm just pushing down and letting the brush drag the paint together a little bit to create more of a, I don't know, more of a scab-like texture rather than perfectly circular splatter. Because the perfectly circular splatter can look a little bit too much like paint, but the dry brush with nothing on it, pushing down, if you don't mind ruining a brush, these are like a buck at like Harbor Freight Tools. Actually, they're not even that, I think they're like 69 cents. I buy them by the box of like 50 and I just throw them away when they get too ruined. Yep, you get like rust streaks and it just looks, It's and there's different types of rust too. I have done a lot of staring at rusty <laughs> uh, things outside over the years. And so you'll learn that there is, if you, if you pay attention, there is a billion different types of rust depending on how paint was layered, depending on the atmospherics, depending on how hard the water is, how much salt is in it. You know, stuff like that. So you might not like the way this rust looks because the rust where you live might look different, you know, uh, on like old cars or on uh, city property or whatever, you know. But I like the way this type of rust looks. <clears throat> so you can see, like, even with just the spray paint, let me turn this up. Even with just spray paint, it looks pretty dang, pretty dang good. Like, looks pretty rusty. And then you come in here with some silver scratch highlights, like I said, and you put a black wash over it or, like, a dark brown wash, you're good to go. Or you could even leave it the way it is. But we're going to go in and do even more stuff. And if you, before you do this, you could spray some spray it with water and sprinkle salt on it and then spray paint it and then peel the salt off and you get crusty salt layer, like, where it's breaking off. Or you could do the same thing with mustard. You can do it with toothpaste. You can stipple on toothpaste Spray paint your colors, peel the toothpaste off, and then you've got broken paint. You know, there's a million cool things you can do with rust and age. So I have never shown those on my channel specifically, I don't think. I think I've shown them to the channel members in the uh, community, the members-only community posts. But I do want to demonstrate that in videos eventually. I know a lot of makers have already done that, but uh, I would like to show my, my take on those methods. But that's the gist of it right there. So I'll just set this off in the distance. This blue wall is pretty good. I'm going to set this back here over near where we were at. So if those colors, again, if you wanted to try it with those exact colors, that was satin espresso, uh, colonial red, cinnamon, satin fire orange, and then we'll, uh, we'll get to these later on in the stream. I'm gonna set these aside on the spray paint wall over here. I have my spray paints arranged by color or like type of thing, like those are clear coats, metallics and textures. Warm colors, cool and cool and green colors, browns and blacks and grays and tans. Colors I use a lot less, but I think are interesting, you know, stuff like that. Dart Mart, you just gotta practice. You gotta think about balancing weight and positive and negative space. You know something you might benefit from? 
is if you're confused about how to lay out your greeblies or your details on a piece like that, maybe watch some, just for inspiration's sake, not that you'd need to go to like school or anything, because I didn't, um, but just go like on YouTube and search up like balancing positive and negative space in interior design or graphic design. Just watch a couple of videos, even if it's from like some random interior designer, you'd be surprised what you might infer just from listening to somebody talk a little bit. Because, well, just like, let me think really quick. So, random smattering of objects. Let's discuss this really quick, because I actually think this is a cool thing to talk about. How to figure out layout and design with random objects. You know, some of it is intuitive, some of it's natural. If you don't have that tendency, like, let me, let's just talk about ways you can think about it. Let me move this up here. Because <clears throat> this uh, may be important to some of you guys. So... Here, here's a bunch of random objects. Just think of this as your greeblies. If you have a bunch of objects or little greeblies or pieces that you like, what are different ways we could arrange this, right? So, well then Dartmart, you could ask your interior, <laughs> your interior designer wife. But this is the type of way like my brain parses things out. Is do I want something to have a direction to it? Do I want it to look like I want your eye to go from left to right or right to left, top to bottom, bottom to top? Top angle to bottom right angle, top right angle to bottom left angle. Is there a reason you want a direction? Like, is it a hallway leading somewhere? Or is it a, a wall with a feature? Like, is there a TV in the middle of the wall? Is there a screen somewhere? Is there a sign somewhere? Does it need to look like there's somebody that needs to go to the right or go to the left? That's a place to start with your layout. Or if you want it to just have an even placement, then you need to figure out size and texture, right? So if I wanted to lay these out so there was a direction, uh, the simplest way to start is like big to small or small to big. So if I start with my biggest objects, let's say I go with my, my pad of paper here, and then I go to my, my uh, roll of tape, and then I place my ruler, and then I place my paintbrush, and then I place my saw, right, then I place my saw, right? I did this because it looks like it's moving away from it, but I want it to look like it's part of the piece, so I turned it this way so the handle looked like it's included. And then I laid my clamp, and then I put in my flathead screwdriver. Well, now my, my brain, when I look at this image, most people's brains are gonna go to the biggest or brightest object first. So most people's brains, if, I, if you were to like close your eyes and then open them, your eyes are probably gonna go straight to this or straight to this. You're gonna naturally go over here because this is the biggest or brightest object in the scene. And you're gonna go, oh, yellow tape, oh, white notepad. Oh, what's that? And then you're gonna start moving this way, right? Or you could arrange it by color, right? You go like brightest colors, right? Or, well, well, color families, that's a good way to do it. So you could go with yellows and then reds and like fill in shapes. Like see, I created a space here. When I put this here and this here, I fill that space in with something that carries on to the next uh, part of the narrative, which is color. I can angle this the same angle as handle. Then I can switch to another similar color and I could change to this because there's a connect. So I've got yellow to red. I, there's a space here and formed that space with a color. I moved on to this color, this color, this color. There's metal, I switched to metal, switched to orange. There's metal, I switched to that. And then there's a like there's a seemingly logical order to this layout that's visually pleasing. Your eye either gets drawn to here or here, and then you follow the objects because there's a subtext. There's metal, metal, orange, metal, orange, bright, bright. That's a red, bright, red, red, metal, red, less metal, uh, metal with yellow, another bright color, yellow, large yellow. You know, like there's some sort of storytelling going on. There's a subtext. Like this is what movies do to us. We might love a movie and we don't, maybe we can't put, quite put our finger on why we love it so much, but there's something visual being laid out in the storytelling or there's something in the dialogue or there's some underlying theme that we can't quite put our finger on. You know, Maybe the story is about an action hero, but the subtext is what it means to be a man. And we, can't really, we don't really infer that the story is about what it means to be a man, but we love the movie and we can tell there's something like, so you're creating a subtext with your layout almost. Right? So let's say like I want to go top right to bottom, right? I can create a visual representation of direction by p 
picking pieces that move, laying pieces out that move in a certain direction or inform that direction or point towards that direction. So there we go. There's a flow. So my brain wants to notice, wants to go, why is this like this? That's visually interesting. I have blank space here, I have blank space here, and there's something that's clearly been defined. It's pleasing to the eye. Like imagine if I had borders here, this would make some visual sense to us, right? And I chose to, again, uh, this is more informing the direction, this is informing the direction. The fact that these are all pointing this way is telling me left, and these are pointing down at an angle, so it's telling me down and left, right? I could do the same thing if I flip it this way, Right, if I flip everything around, and I can even I can even change some of the direction of some of the objects like this if I wanted to. I can create an actual arrow if I feel well, yeah, a little hard with some of these, but pretty random shapes. Same thing though, like I'm creating an arrow here. Everything kind of looks like it belongs where it belongs, or or like seems to belong where where it is, even though it's a random smattering of objects, you know. So stuff like that is how my brain thinks. And if I'm thinking like weight and balance, if I have a rectangle like I had before and I use the same objects, if I put a big heavy object up here at the top left, I probably want to put a big heavy object down here at the, at the bottom right so that there's like almost like scales, like there's a balancing going on. So if I put a big heavy object, well, okay. So I have a yellow object here. Maybe I should do a yellow object on the other side. So if I do a yellow object on the top right, I need something on the top left to balance it out, but I don't want to do yellow. Maybe I want to do metal. So I'll take something with more metal on it. So now I've got a bottom and I've got a top. This bottom is defined by metal, the color of bare metal. This, this is defined by the color of yellow. I've got two objects that are sort of similar in proportion when, if you condense them, they've got a similar proportion in weight and each corner feels balanced, top and bottom feel balanced. I've got a red color here that's standing out on its own. How do I balance that out? Well, that's also the first angle I've got that's not uh, you know, informing a 90 or a perpendicular or a parallel. So what if I just, and it's pretty much right in the center, like here's right the center of my piece. So what if I mirror this? So if it was like this, if I just flip this and mirrored it and put it up here, right? I've got red and red matching in the center and I've got metal going away and metal going away and I've matched this angle, right? So here's an, uh, Two, here's five objects that visually look like one, two, three, four, five, six almost. I've got three colors. There's a top and a bottom and sides clearly defined. So like this is how you can start to parse out space, right? Like here, here's another one. We've got gold and yellow. Gold and yellow are similar, but the thing that makes these similar too is they're both thin objects. So let's say I take this yellow. There's still a lot of yellow on this side. If I want to balance out the yellow, I could make it brighter over here or I could even it out. I could make another visual line like that, and then I could echo that visual line maybe over here, or maybe, yeah, maybe over here to create some more balance and symmetry there. So I'm just using positive and negative spaces where there is basically no object or a, uh, you know, or a large amount of blank unused space and positive spaces where there is used space. So positive, negative, left to right, top to bottom, matching color, matching weight, matching, that's how I laid out that wall with the random pieces. That's how my brain did that. I didn't think that as doing it, but this is like the process that my brain sort of went through just from naturally doing this stuff many times over with in Photoshop, in Rhinoceros 3D, in AutoCAD, when I worked on like house plans, when I did mechanical drafting, um, when I painted paintings, when I wrote songs, my brain learned to parse things out like that. So you just have to do it. You just gotta go for it. And if you have to, sort your objects out first. If you have a, 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 a tray of objects that are all different, sort them out. Pick something to sort them out by. Texture, size, thickness, shape, color. Like if you have a bunch of, if you have like yellow, red, and blue objects, sort them out by yellow, red, and blue. If you have thin objects, thick objects, and sharp objects, sort them out that way. If you have triangular objects and you have nuts and bolts that are hex shaped, move those out of there, sort them by size. If they're all random, just sort of small, medium, large. Start laying them out by size, you know, stuff like that. That's that's how I'm doing this, right? In the with random objects. That's how my brain kind of picks it up.
Hope that made sense. <laughs> okay, let's do another wall. Same thing here. This is 11 by 14 MDF quarter inch thick backer board. I still didn't put the link in from last week because I'm a doofus, but I'll put one in eventually. <laughs> if you're watching in the future times, there will probably be a link below. And I'm gonna draw my one inch demarcation for where I want to define uh, the slot. I'm gonna have these slot in under a shelf. It's gonna overhang these with lights facing down. Like this is the if this is the top and the bottom, right and left side. There's gonna be a shelf that comes out and this is gonna slot in uh, to like a pocket under the shelf. So I'm gonna just mark that so I don't accidentally build up into where I want it to slide into the pocket. I'm just using my mat to line up a one inch mark in a mechanical pencil. Yeah, uh, Bart, I'm glad that was helpful. You can get, or sorry, Bart, Dart Mart. Um, I'm glad that was helpful. You can get way deeper than that too. That's why I said, go watch some random interior design videos, how to balance images, how to lay out space, especially in graphic design. Graphic design can be very helpful because they're trying to do a lot with a little and uh, good graphic designers are very good. Invisible Element uh, is a great resource for that. I don't know how much he talks about that on his channel, but he does a great job with that. Balancing out designs. Um, he's the one who did my logo. Um, so those types of things can at least get your mind thinking on those terms. You know what I mean? Okay, so what I had in mind for this was laying out all of these boards. Make sure I have the best looking boards here before I start. And that is exactly what I need. I'm just gonna do this. And, yep. And we're gonna score it like this. So this isn't too difficult of a process. What's up, Fishnet? Thanks for stopping by. Look at that, look how the color changes. Bright blue, yellow. Bright blue, yellow. Auto color, focus. What is it, what's it? White balance, that's the thing I'm looking for. Okay, so we're going to do these little grooves here in all these boards, because these are too thick. These look out of scale to me. This feel, this would be correct for like um, one six scale or one quarter scale, like board and batten on a wall. Um, but I'm doing one twelfth scale, so. I might want to back the camera up because that's very yellow and that changes to a bluish white and this is more true to real life. What is up, Drunk Gizmo? All right. <clears throat> so, I'm going to mark on my cutting mat where all of these centers are. I'm just gonna do this visually. I'm not gonna measure. I'm using, um, it's two, these are an inch and three quarters wide. So to find the center, I'm just going with a two inch segment of my cutting mat and I'm visually centering and I'm making sure the sides, the spacing on both sides in between my two inch and two inch marks is even. And then I'm just marking the center point on this line. And then I'm just flipping it over and doing the same thing. All right. And then I'm lining up those two pencil marks and then I'm gonna take my little box cutter and cut a groove carefully like that. And I'm not gonna cut all the way through. And then I'm gonna take my little hole punch and I'm just gonna just gonna push it through, push it down and drag it through. I'm using it because it has this defined tip See, it's got that defined tip, and I want a groove that's roughly that shape in my, in my, I'm creating, trying to make it look like two boards with a bevel, like that. There we go. Okay. And then you see there's some flash there. That's from the paint cracking off and stuff, because this, these were pre-painted pieces of wood I found. I'm gonna just scrape it out with my blade like that. I'm taking the blade side of it and putting it at an angle into the piece and then just scraping it through. 
letting it peel the paint off. And there we go. That's pretty much it. It's a little uneven right there. I'm just gonna run it through again. Same thing here, like that. And these walls are not for sale. These are part of my display, right? So, but as such, I'm making them out of very cheap materials I already had lying around. This center point is off just a little bit, but that's okay. Maybe I'll save this for an in piece. So then maybe what I'll do, since my center point was off, I'll mark it with the knife instead of with the pencil. I find sometimes that helpful if you mark it with a knife, like that, then you can get a more accurate centering when you do cut, because that one was a little off, like that. And now, if I line my knife up here on the bottom and then on the top, and keep this as straight as I can, then we're good, there we go, there we go. And I'm dragging it through twice, there's my line, get this thing out. This is essentially the same principle as making miniature brick in foam. I'm just using heavier duty objects and heavier duty materials. here. I'm using my cut mark. I'm putting my blade in that cut and butting my ruler up to it and then lining up the other side up here visually. So I know this one's perfect. Now up here I can just line this one up and cut down. Well, that's a good enough group. Okay, there we go. Same thing here. You don't have to use this as a metal hole punch or a starter hole punch. I forgot what these are called. There's an actual name for these, but they're, this one is actually busted. It's uh, a little one of the little pins inside. It's supposed to be spring-loaded, and you push, and it goes plunk, and it puts a hole in metal so that you can drill an aligned hole in your metal without your bit sliding all over the place. Hole punch, I guess. Hole starter. Oops. I already messed up. The blade was extended too far out. That's okay. I'll sand that out. Oh no! That's all right. I can just flip it over and do the other side. I don't like it. Um, it doesn't have to be one of these. Is what I was trying to say. You can use anything that's got a point to it that is not going to cut. You know, you can use the edge of a piece of metal you've got lying around, whatever. Ugh. Okay, I need to slow down. I'm in a bit of a rush here. I messed that one up totally. Well, let me try this again here. Slow down, Wheeler. pushed too hard towards the ruler when I was doing it and the ruler went like this, bloop, and it made the line messed up. Oh, oh my gosh. I messed this one up too. Oh, good thing I have spares. Oh my gosh, that's what I get. All right, let me see how many I Oh, I'm moving too fast. Slow down, slow down. There's two, I just need four, I need six more. Okay. I have enough. Ay, ay, ay. Slow down even more, I guess. This wood is very soft, which is part of the problem. This wood is from a uh, installation job I did a long, long time ago in a home, and I've just saved it because it's very soft wood and it's already thin cut. So I was like, hey, that's good project wood, and it is. It's meant to be for spacing things out and trimming stuff. 
but it's so it's very soft. It's meant to be cut with a blade like this so that if you're out on a job and you don't have the right power tool to shape something, you can just literally just do it with a box cutter um, like I'm doing it. So it's meant to be soft, but unfortunately that's a double-edged sword. And if you push too hard and get off course, then you get a big old drag mark in it that you don't want. Okay. I'll show you how easy this is to carve. There we go. That looks correct. Okay, so that's what I mean. Like I got this drag mark in there. So you can literally just super easy to carve and cut. So it's cool. I don't know if it's like just soft basswood or what. It's not, I don't think it's pine because it's the, the green looks too dense, but it's very soft. So this stuff is very nice to carve with. Hey, Tech Chucker, what's up? Everybody say hi to Tech Chucker. It's the first person to interview me um, in the online spaces. Thank you so much for being here. I'm glad you're getting some work on your own stuff done. I know it always takes forever when you have your own channels and stuff to run. Um, and I know you have a family, so thanks for being here. I'm glad you're getting your own stuff done. It's always satisfying when you're trying to get something done, you can never get it done, then you finally get around to doing it. There we go. Okay. Art in real time. For those of you who don't know, this is my art in real time series where we do art in real time. And you get to see real mistakes in real time. Like that. None of that fancy YouTube editing where you just looks like I'm a genius. Because I'm not. I'm a doofus. Just ask my wife. She knows. Almost done here. Over halfway done. Well, actually we're, well, yeah, we are just over halfway done with this wall. Oh gosh. Uh, every time I think I'm in the clear, I do it. Okay. Too soft, and I am too ADD for soft wood. Okay. So this is probably basswood because this stuff came with um, where this comes from. This actually comes from China. Um, this wood with the product that it comes with, but I do know they make other parts of the product out of a specific type of light basswood they make there. Which is that harder hobby wood you can get at the hobby store. There's basswood. You have balsa wood and you have basswood. Basswood is a lot more rigid than balsa wood. It's a lot stronger. I prefer it. I do very, very little myself with balsa wood. Not that it's not an amazing wood to work with. But I just find that I've gotten comfortable working with stiffer materials. And that don't... Uh, that don't that, are, that agree more with the types of finishing techniques that I like to use. I like basswood because it's harder and stiffer and it responds to moisture better. Like balsa wood, you like touch it with wood glue and it goes and it warps up like crazy. So, which is fine. You just have to clamp it in place and let it dry, you know, straight. But I just, I like to, I like to not have to worry about things like that because those are the types of things that I, I, I forget to do. And then it, like I walk away for 20 minutes and go paint something and come back and my Mm, balsa wood masterpiece is warped, warped beyond repair because I forgot that balsa wood is so light when it absorbs any moisture it warps and I'm like, oh, 
I forgot about that. But it's great for miniature boats and planes and if you can stomach the miniature furniture and clamping things in place, you know. But I've gotten so used to working with the harder woods that I kind of don't like balsa wood as much as I used to growing up. My dad did a lot of stuff with balsa wood, which I have a fondness for it, but again, just gotten away from it. Should probably get some. I haven't used balsa wood in a long time. Now that I'm saying this all out loud, I feel like I should go buy some and start messing with it more again. Maybe I'll change my mind. Okay. Dos mas. Dos mas. Also, I feel like when I'm making a nice miniature thing that's not just for me, but for just to sell, I feel like balsa wood, like you breathe on it and it breaks, you know what I mean? So I like working with something that's a little bit more, got a little bit more longevity to it. Balsa wood makes a good veneer, miniature veneer. No! Don't. That's what you get. Okay. It's gonna come down to the last two pieces. Uh, I have more of this. I can cut some more. I just don't want to do that. I guess I'm gonna use those for miniature furniture. <laughs> Stupid soft wood. Why must you be so soft? You're gonna obey me. You're gonna obey me. I command you. I'm not gonna push hard. Okay, we're gonna get along. We're all gonna enjoy our cross country tip together as a family and we're not gonna fight. There we go. There was an earthquake here today in northern Nevada. I was going to the bathroom. And I thought an elephant had like ran through the wall next to me. I was like, what was that? I hadn't felt an earthquake in a long time. Okay, I have to use the other side of this piece that I painted. Because it's the only one left that isn't messed up. Okay, otherwise I'll just have to go cut another piece. I don't want to. I don't want to go to school today. Okay. One, two. Okay. Remember what I said, children. We're going to get along as a family and we're not going to start a fight in this car. Or I'm going to pull over and so help me. I will s you won't like it. Your mother's worked very hard to go on this trip for us. <laughs> okay. Ah, all right, that was stressful. Yeah, no pressure, right, Eric? Thanks for being here, Eric Bradshaw. <sighs> Good thing I cut extras. <sighs> okay, there it is. <laughs> now we just gotta sand the edges and glue it down. Bad basswood. Bad basswood. Can I break this? Nope, I can't. It's too hard. I tried. Now I want to use. Sanding block with really worn down 120 grit sandpaper. I'm just gonna round over the adjoining edges so they have the same bevel as the center. Oops. Yep. That's 
so that this little beveled edge matches this bevel on the inside here. And I've noticed over the years as I sand, especially an edge like this, not a flat edge, but an actual edge edge with two surfaces, I find that I get a better, more consistent edge. You see that exposed edge that I did there? Like down here might need a little bit more, like that, too much. <laughs> But instead of grind, instead of sanding it at a perfect angle like this, if I tilt the block at like a at like a thirty degree angle and then sand, I get a more consistent bevel naturally, just because the way my hand moves. So instead of going like this, I take this and I go like this. Just sort of naturally comes out better. You can see that on camera. It's a little hard to see. So there's our edge before, right? rounded over or like see that's got a bevel on it now that doesn't now we have a nice bevel Ta -da. Good. I see your comments rolling in. Hold on a minute. Let me just get this done. I find when I start doing like a bunch of little edges like this, if I don't just do them all in the same go, I will forget to do one and then I'll paint it and then I'll notice it when I'm done and I can't take it apart and then I'll yell and throw it across the room and do it all over again. I don't want to do that. Thank you guys again for all the likes. Thank you to everybody who's been here, who is here, and who will be here, especially in the future times. You're the real heroes. Ghost face, what's up? What are you saying? Legend series is we're working on a sewer dial with actual water features. Sweet. Have I ever done miniatures like the Star Wars galaxy size dioramas? Kind of new to the channel. Star Wars galaxy size dioramas. Star Wars galaxy. Which? What do you mean Star Wars galaxy? You mean like the Micro Machines Star Wars Galaxy size? Because I am doing working on some of that in the background. I have three of those that I'm going to be making dioramas for. <sighs> uh, but I have a whole playlist called the Tiny Art Experiment. Where some of those are included in my live streams playlist where I go over making um, Star Wars desert-themed planet Tatooine-style dioramas in 118th scale, which you can apply to any scale, so you could check that out. Uh, for now, um, but almost all my videos cover a technique or a skill or something you could use in any diorama, to be honest. Um, I try to make sure that they're chock full of dio goodness. So, okay. Now, we just do the good old eraser clap over here. Get all the dust off. Okay, there we go. Okay. I'm going to probably glue these down. I'm gonna to have to clamp two boards together here. I'm gonna go grab another board from over here. Hold on a sec. 
Food and sawdust. I'm using the Tight Bone 3 Ultimate Wood Glue. Now I'm going to do some fun dioramas this year for videos. And I uh, had some fun ideas to do some stuff with those um, Micro Machine size Star Wars uh, pieces. I've had a few of them I haven't even unboxed for a while. And I got one of the newer sets because I'm like, hey, that would be a fun diorama. So I am going to do some like mini dioramas <clears throat> just to mix it up a little bit. Um, I know people like those and I've been wanting to do those for years. I've just gotten stuck in the habit of doing these big grandiose things. So which I'm going to still continue to do, but I'm going to try to mix it up and do a little bit of everything. And kind of just, just do big grandiose things because sometimes doing those smaller contained pieces can be a nice refreshing treat for people. Especially me. <laughs> So I'm just going to spread a bunch of glue on the back of this and spread a bunch of glue right here. And I might actually ruin my brush for this one too. Yeah, just to get that glue even. I'm going to do this. And these MDF boards, they will, they can like warp a little, especially with moisture. That's why I'm going to clamp two of these together, or two boards together over this and weight it down. Because if I don't, it will probably want to warp towards the glue side or away from it, depending on how the glue wants to dry. So I'm just going to push this down into place. Ooh, that's a lot. Okay, probably overdid it on the glue a little. That's okay. I'm going to use these spare boards to line this up with the edge and the bottom. And I'm gonna use a little less glue on this one, so. Glue over here, and glue over here, a lot less. Just go ahead and do this, spread the glue around with a brush. Brush. Get a little glue on the side of this one here. Oops, push that back into place. That's okay. And then I'm gonna put this one down. That's bueno. Okay, same thing here. Can't wrangle here, will you? Same thing here. around Alrighty. Da -da -da -da. Da -da -da -da. Brush our glue, brush our glue, brush our glue. This is the way we brush our glue. All right, go back and forth. Oop, a little glue spilled through there. Fingernails, scrape that out of there. That's good. I'm gonna try not to disturb this side too much because it's kind of starting to set. Okay. Get you guys an alternate angle here.
wiggle. Sometimes I do the wiggle on the glue just to get it to kind of spread out and kind of grip onto itself. Glue on both sides too when you're gluing wood to wood is really essential for a strong bond. Uh, you can do one side, but it's entirely possible that most of the glue, like if I just did it on the MDF side and not on this and pressed it down, most of the glue would bond only to the MDF side because it would sink into the MDF and not bond as strongly to this. Now I am gluing basically MDF to paint because this is painted wood. If I wanted to be an absolute perfectionist about it, I would sand open the paint off of both these sides and then glue them down. But because this is a small piece and it's the display, I think the glue will hold just fine to the paint because the paint is bonded to the wood nicely. Not really worried about it. But ideally, if I wanted to be a perfectionist, like if I was making a, a display I was selling to somebody that I wanted to last, you know, 40, 50 years, I would sand both sides on my belt sander so that it was raw wood and glue the raw wood to the MDF. But because this is such a small little thing and it's a display that's just for sort of quick decorative purposes, I'm not gonna freak out about it. It's gonna, it, it'll be fine. <clears throat> and I plan on switching these walls out over time, so even if like, let's say the glue dries and this cracks off or something, I can just glue it back on, I don't really care. It's a lot of extra work to go through for something that probably won't ever happen. But again, if I was doing like a big old four foot by two foot piece of this, I would sand off all the paint or I would just use bare wood that wasn't painted. You know what I mean? Probably do the latter. But we're working with what I got lying around today. So, cause it's cheaper and quicker. Everybody loves cheaper and quicker. There we go. It looks like someone meant to do this. It's always what we're going for. All right. Gonna spread out as evenly as the last two, that's okay. here on the bottom okay that's pretty great make sure this is wiped off now I'm going to Sure you close the lid of your glue your wood glue by the way make sure you do that otherwise you'll have a lot of fun cleaning glued off in off of the inside and top of this okay got dry wood glue on my fingers all right clamp this on top of this make sure everything stays aligned I love these little DeWalt clamps. You can get these at Home Depot. I have like a dozen of these. I use them all the time. You could use a lot of clamps. You can use strap clamps. You can use corner clamps. You can use um, vice clamps. You can clamp this on a vice. You can put a bunch of weight on top of it, on a pile of books on top of it, whatever. I'm just gonna do this because that's what I'm used to and it works good. Look at all the glue seeping out. All that glue that was ready to just express itself. That's what glue sounds like when it's expressing itself. 
Okay. So since it's basically glue um, on the paint side, it's sort of, I'm almost sort of like laminating the painted side to the MDF. And that's actually seeping out a lot. So I'm just going around wiping off some of the excess. So that it doesn't glue my clamps to it. <laughs> Don't want that. A lot of glue on that first one and that end one. That's okay. Okay, I'm gonna have to sand it anyways, but that's okay. I'm gonna put a couple more clamps on it. Doot, 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 doot. Okay, that should be good by the end of the stream. I can probably pull that off and it'll stay where I want it to. Actually, that looks like it needs to go up there. There we go. Okay, delicious wood sandwich. Okay. Let's do another one. This is now ruined. Throw this away. Glue that to that for no reason. All right, hold on one second. Let me just go this way. Okay. 34 people and 34 likes. Sweet. Michael Dumas, as long as you got clamps, give them clamps. Yes, Eric. Give them the clamps. Futurama. Okay, Let's see if we can do something with these. I'm just going to lay these out to see if we can make them look cool. If they don't look cool, then we'll do something else. But, and by the way, I have to say, <coughs> excuse me, you can get some really pretty stuff out of tongue depressors and popsicle sticks. So, just like look at these two pieces of wood. They're really pretty. Like this one looks more like your generic popsicle stick, but this one's got a lot of fine grain in it, and this one's got a darker grain. I, I've made some really pretty looking things. Like even just like those three things right there, if you were to just glue those all together <clears throat> like that and then cut them off and stain it, you'd get three different gradients out of the same type of wood from popsicle sticks. Sand it down and then put a gloss coat. You got yourself a nice little miniature tabletop made from popsicle sticks. So I'm gonna lay some 45 degree angles on this just as a guide or a reference. Not with any intention of like specific patterns, but just so that they're on here. I'm gonna use my square, my speed square. And just maybe I'll do one here in the corner, starting from this corner. Do one starting from this corner up here. And then just a couple other random ones maybe. Just so that as I'm laying these out, I can keep them parallel to one another. They're just reference lines, really. So, like that. <clears throat> so that I have some reference so that I'm not, like, slowly fanning the pieces out this way or like that. So that I can kind of keep them aligned with the next thing I see. Kind of the same way I do brick. I'll visually align the brick. So, let's just see if this could look cool or not. So... If I do them like 50% where it's divided 50% into the next layer, the next line, whatever that, whatever that stack pattern is called, I already forgot. <clears throat> Let's see if this could look cool or not. That rhymed. Sounded like a Dr. Seuss rhyme. Oh, I got some of these like this. I didn't mean to do that. That's okay. 
I'm sure I can find cool space. Those will be like little reverse Uno sticks. See how I cut these different? That's okay. I'll use those as reverse Unos. Let me just try them with all the same real quick to see what it might look like. If I want to do this way, or if I want to go that way, or if I want to intersect them and do different things, or what. This one's going to be fun, too. Because I'm going to have to constantly keep something clamped on it because of the um, wood glue. Wanting. This stuff will want to warp because it's a thin, kind of like balsa wood, like what I was saying. So, Or I could use a non-water-based glue, and that will make that happen less like i could use my i could use epoxy or i could use spray glue and then layer it with like a layer of resin or something um, later to prevent the pain of me having to constantly clamp it things down so that it doesn't peel up <clears throat> okay is that gonna look cool or is that gonna look stupid i don't know I don't know what I've been told. Glue and popsicle sticks is old. Sound off. <laughs> I don't know. What do you guys think? Does that look cool? Is that gonna look cool? I finished the whole wall. I mean, I'm going to tighten up all these seams, but I just want to get a general feel for it. Or is that going to look stupid? I don't know. We could just tie an onion to our belt, which was the style of the time. But I don't know if that's going to help us. The other thing I was thinking too is actually just doing this, but vertically, like that. But now that I just did that, I'm liking that even better. I don't even have to do the whole wall. I could just do sections of the wall. And now that I say that, I like that idea. I might do that. I like it a lot. Okay. We're gonna do that. Because I've just decided randomly to do that. Here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna measure in. Three, two inches. And then I'm gonna do a section that's three inches. And then I'm gonna measure in two inches. And I'm gonna do a section that's three inches. Well, how, how big is the section if I stack up three? If I stack up three, that is two and a half-ish. What about four? If I stack up four, that is, yeah, okay. We'll do a section that's four wide, a little less than three inches. All right. Vertical line there. Reference line there. A lot of reference lines. Reference line here. Reference line here. Voila. And then I could do some vertical lines with some of my scrap wood from over here. I have this stuff. From when I bought that dollhouse stuff I was talking about last week from that gentleman that he pre actually pre-painted white before I ever got my hands on it. Maybe I'll do that. Are these the same thickness? A little less. Okay, that'll look cool. A little bit of a deviation there so we get three different heights. Yep. Yep. Okay. I'm going to do that. Oh, I forgot to do my demarcation, didn't I? Of my one inch down. Do that before I forget. Thanks for reminding me. Gosh. Just kidding. There we go. Do do do. 
Litter run, little litter, little, little, I can't speak tonight. Little mermaid is stuck in my head, but under the sea, but it is. Because reasons. Where's my little cutter? There it is. Yeah, you know what? I'm gonna sand this side really quick. And I'm gonna lay down EPS glue so I don't have to clamp this down while I do this because the wood glue is gonna want to peel it up or put weight on it. <clears throat> Which is gonna make this it's gonna make it hard to see. Actually, I'm gonna start over here. Yep. Come on, come on, come on. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. And then we'll just leave that there. Okay. Now I have to decide. I'm going to stack these up and find the least warped pieces really quick. For this first section. So if I do this. You can kind of see what the most warped pieces are. So this one is super warped. Set that aside for something else. Bottom one is pretty warped. Top one is pretty warped too. That's a pretty good stack. That's not too bad. Just a little bit of bow. Okay, so these are all super warped. I'll use these on something else. Then <clears throat> it's a matter of do I want to start it? I guess I'll just use one of my reference lines to start it. Yep, and I'm gonna cut this off now so that I can use this piece on top or in another spot if I need to. I could glue it all down and then cut it all off later, but I'm gonna go ahead and just trim it now. Now I'm going to switch to the wood glue. And on this one, I'm only going to use, put glue down on one side. Oops, come on. There we go. And I'm not going to need a ton here. So I'm going to use the piece to spread it. Wiggle it into place and put it down. Pick the next piece. You can flex these a little bit too if they're a little warpy. These also respond really well to heat. that I cut off, it's a little too short. It's okay. I have to cut it off. Cut off the tops later with a blade up here. No problem. Do that. Boom. 
that's like a pretty piece of wood right there. <clears throat> do I want to continue this way or do I want to flip it? I think I want to flip it. Flip it good. So if I center that. Nah, I think I want to go like herringbone, which is like, you know, joining up together um, and fanning out like a herringbone. Maybe I spread that a little too thin. That's okay. Herringbone. 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 What's up, Mario? Thanks for being here. We're gluing popsicle sticks down, pretending like we're adults. Well, I'm, that's what I'm doing. I don't know what everyone else is doing, but that's what I'm doing. I'm just gonna go ahead and glue in the next herringbone piece because I'm a rebel and I wanna mess with people's OCD. Snap. Satisfying snap. That's wanting to warp up a little up there. How dare you disobey me? Okay. Go ahead and do this. Probably just use my finger. It'll be more even. Macaroni? I got some. Bust out the macaroni. I got beans and lentils too. You know what beans, lentils, and macaroni are good for in dioramas? Alien eggs. That's what those are good for. Or as my ex-roommate Jeremy would say, X. I don't know why he liked to say eggs that way. I don't know why he just did. Ooh, look at that. I messed it up. <sighs> That's okay. Look at that. It looks like poop. Okay, fine. It's too big. That's okay. I can always trim it down. All right. Go back up here. Is this long enough to go up here? No. Of course it's not. the room. I'm kind of just putting the glue in the center here and letting it squish out because it's such a small piece. I'm not really worried about 
like like I did on the last one where I spread it with the brush. It's pretty small, so it'll just squish out to where I need it naturally. This is wanting to pop up a little right there. So we're going to weight that down with this and a one, two, three block. Stay there. Over here and do this side. Actually, I should probably put an alignment piece here really quick. Mint piece, whatever. Trim, whatever the piece, the word is. Wiggle it into place. There we go. There we go. Okay. I need to cut an identical piece to match this side. Another way you cut these is with a um, just a box cutter like I normally do. Just to show you guys here, you can just do it with box cutter if you want. Don't do it with a very extended blade like I just did though. Careful. Ta da! here. is kind of off. 
It's a little wobbly side to side. Come on. Oh, gosh. It's got like a curve in it. Can't use that one. I can use that one. How's that one? That's better. Too curvy. No room for curvy wood here. Definitely gonna need to get clamped down here. There we go. Got wood glue all over my hands. All right, thanks for putting up with my quiet uh, board time, <laughs> whatever you wanna call this. Art in real time. It's a heck of a thing. All right. Back to this, press. And this here, that uh, probably needs a little more glue than that. And now that's probably too much glue. Okay. There we go. Troy Dodson, that is a genius idea. Elbow mac and, elbow mac and cheese noodles for pipe joints. I think you're onto something there. Like, seriously. <laughs> you're doing like, like you know, what is it, like 45 degree angles? You'd probably get that to work. Oh man, that is a warpy warp. Sir, warpy warp. Okay. How about you stay? Unwarped and do what I say. Okay. Almost there. See, in these little cutoffs that I have, you have stuff like this, save them. You'll never know, or you'll you'll never know when you'll find a cool project to use them on. <clears throat> like, I could turn that into a miniature tabletop like I was talking about before. It would be great. Gotta make the fart noise. Just, I just have to. The inner 10 year old boy in my heart wants to leap for joy with the fart noise. Can't help it. Okay. 
almost there. Almost there. Almost there. Ba -na -na -na. I'm gonna have to clean off my cutter. That's okay. We're okay, folks. Thanks again, guys, for all the likes, even though I know I haven't been talking much for the last 20 minutes. Just, I'm in the zone here. I'm in the zone. I'm in the zone. more one, two, three blocks. And then I can cut this off here with my blade. Okay. There's another wall we can let dry. Let me take all these scraps here and put them together, set them aside for future use. Cut off two now for something. see how dry they are. Or you can watch me peel wood glue off my fingers. Mmm. That's weird. Alright. I'm gonna set this back behind me. Hold on. Hello. Let's set this back over here. Looking mighty blue. Let me go grab the rusty, rusty wall here. Here's the rusty wall. Looks pretty bright on screen under these lights, but it's it's got some nice tonal changes going on in it. You can see it when I tilt it like that. Direct lights looks very orange, but this is more like what I see. Like that. Yeah. See when you change the lighting angle too, it looks dramatically, dramatically different. Okay, so let's do, how much time we got? Two hours. Let's do uh, one more wall glue up and then we'll, uh, do some finishing on this. We'll let this keep drying here. Let's check on the table I stained as well. Here's the table that I stained at the beginning. And that's it's looking pretty good the way it is. Honestly, this is kind of what I was going for. So I'm not sure. I don't think I need to do a second coat. It'll probably make it look too dark. 
So what I might do is lightly sand this with like 300 grit sandpaper very lightly and see if it brightens it up too much. If it does, I'll stain it again. But if it looks pretty good just with the light sanding, then I'll probably just clear coat it with a satin or a flat clear coat, clear coat, clear coat and call it good. I like it. Can't you just see drinking coffee off this, hugging your loved one in the morning while watching Good Morning America? No, I'm just kidding. Lovely. Trying to think of sales pitches for my miniature tables. Okay. Uh, I need to get another wall. Let me go to my stack of in-stock walls over here. Black Widow spiders moving in over here. I didn't say you can move in over here, ladies. Uh. Kneeling down, I just noticed a bunch of new spider webs over there in the corner. I'm gonna have to get the vacuum out. Okay. Literally comic book backer boards here. This is a nice stiff cardboard. It's basically cereal box cardboard. So um, it, you can grab a cereal box if you don't have any comic book backer boards around. This is thicker. This is like a mylite. Well, it's like a thin mylite. And this is like the thin cardstock, but they're both the same, roughly the same thickness and density. And this stuff is uh, fun to mess with too. So this is going to be a, much, a, little, a bit more purposeful, a bit more intentionally laid out here. I'm going to draw the pattern on here and then we'll trace it out. I'm going to draw it on here so I get exact measurements. I'm going to do my one inch mark down here for my slotted wall idea thing. I'm a bobber. Like that. And then, what I want to do is plot out um, some raised trim. So I'm thinking uh, kind of the standard style that a lot of people see with this is like either big rectangles or a big rectangle and a square on the bottom or like horizontal rectangle, smaller rectangle with a big vertical rectangle, which I think is kind of where I'm gonna go with this. I just kind of got to figure out how many split ups I want to do. If I want to do four or five, I think I want to do five. I think five makes the most sense to me visually. One, two, three, four, five. Or four, I could just do four. Five might look too busy. So what's 14? But if I do four, one, two, three, four. I need three divisions. So, uh, yeah, okay. So I need to mark the halfway point, which is seven, and then three and a half, and then 10 and a half. And I'm just gonna mark halfway points. So this is just, I'm equally dividing this up into four right now. four divisions and then I'm going to place them inside of these divisions and I need to figure out do I want to go a third up what's the third a third up um, for my lower rectangle yeah four is gonna look right five would have been too much so ten if I go up three inches three and a half is probably too much three inches now nah, three and a half Three and a quarter. I'm gonna go up three and a one, two, three and a quarter inches for my 
division here. A little trick you can do is this. If you do, this doesn't go the full distance, you can put a flat ruler on your speed square. You can move your ruler back and forth to get to your full distance here. Okay. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I want them to fit inside of these, and I don't need to figure out what my offset is from these center points, because these are the centers of the divisions in between the pieces of trim, the frames of trim that I want to make. And so I need to figure out how far in I want them to be, basically how much space in between each piece. And I think about a quarter of an inch in between is probably good. Or do I want to go three eighths? So if I go three eighths, I'm just marking these divisions here. Three eighths would be three sixteenths out from the center point. I know I'm saying a lot of things. I'll show you why I'm doing it here in a minute. It'll make sense. It's all part of the plan. So I'm going to mark 3 sixteenths in down here, 3 sixteenths right here, 3 sixteenths right here, 3 sixteenths right there. So what this is giving me is my measurement of my width of each piece, my measurement of my height of each piece of rectangular trim in each section. Okay, so you see these arrows? That's the extents, not the line. That's the center split, but if I go there to there and there to there and cut a rectangle out, and then cut another inner rectangle out, then I have a trim piece, and I lay them out evenly in between all these lines I drew. I have a nice evenly spread out layout, and when I paint it, it'll look like I never even did any of this. So you don't have to do it this way either. You can lay it out according to the dimensional thickness. I just chose to go center points or center splits in between the, the two pieces. So if I have a piece here and a piece here, I measured on the center line in between them. You could measure over to the edge, the trim, the space in between, but that's even more math, which I'm not going to get into. But this, all of this comes from my technical drafting, working backwards from the simplest measurement or the simplest way to lay it out, especially if I'm trying to decide as I'm going. Finding center lines or center points of circles, center points of arches, drawing out from there and working backwards on the math uh, for how you want to lay it out is usually the fastest way to get measurements that you can use to cut stuff. With that said, my widths, because uh, I so now now that I have this established width, I don't have to split up all these dimensions on this because I can just draw what I want and cut 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 cut. I don't have to split it up like I did this once I establish all these numbers. So I'm gonna write on here my width is going to be three and one eighth is the width of all these sections. The height of the top section is gonna be six and a half. The height of the bottom section is gonna be two and seven eighths. So what I can do is I can add these two together to get six, seven, eight, nine, and three eighths. So if I add these two together, I get nine and three eighths. So basically, if I can, I can measure nine and three eighths up and whatever this width is over a couple of times and cut a few pieces out. Or I can, if I have a sheet that's bigger than this, I can draw them all in one sheet and cut them out at one go. It doesn't really matter. I should probably use the same material though. These are both two different pieces of material. This one has a texture, this one doesn't. It's hard to see. There you go. Let me get one that's the same because I want to cut them all out of the same material. <clears throat> and go back over into the spider's den. Also make a call here too depending on what you want 
you know, uh, one side of this has got a gloss finish, one side of this has a slight textured finish, depends on, if you, if you paint this with spray paint, you're gonna see some texture through it. If you paint this, it'll be much smoother. So this might match that. This would offset that because this has got a, like a little bit of a grain to it. So it just depends on what you want to go for. You might like a certain aesthetic style. So I think I can get all my pieces out of these two boards here. So my height is nine and three eighths. So if I just simply cut this off at nine and three eighths, Just lining this up perfectly on the mat so I can just do one slice. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and three eighths. Puts me right here. Let me just check that measurement. Oh no, I was way off. Ha ha! Nine and three eighths is right there. Ha ha! Good thing I checked. Is that right? Yeah, okay. Now I'm gonna move my pencil mark to a line on my mat, just over a little bit. Little trick here. Instead of measuring both sides, measure one side, line it up with your cutting mat, make sure the perpendicular line is square to the mat, perfectly perpendicular, so that this line and this line are perpendicular on the mat, then just use your mat to line it up. You don't have to measure twice and possibly be off. Now I'm just going to cut this off. See that? I only measured down here. A little spare piece I can save or something. Now this is the total height of this and this added together. So when I cut this off and spread them apart, they'll be evenly spaced in there. And my width is three and an eighth. So I should be able to get two sections out of this. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna score it. I'm just gonna score, I'm not gonna actually cut through for this part because I wanna do multiple cuts in multiple directions. So I'm gonna line this up on my mat here again, really nice. And then I'm gonna go over three and one eighth. So this one I will measure three and one eighth down here, right there. And then three and one eighth again. Okay, and then I'm gonna line it up on the mat. Take that mark and move it over to here. So it's lined up with a line on the mat. Make sure that this is perpendicular. Line up this with the other side so I don't have to measure twice and possibly mess up my measurement because the tolerances of your measurements can be th all thrown off by the thickness of the lead of your pencil and the thickness of the lines on your mat, or I mean on your ruler. So there's my scored line there. It's not actually cut all the way. I'm gonna do this one. I'll flip it over and I'll line up this mark up here on the line on my mat. Make sure it's perpendicular to the other line on the mat. And then that looks good on that edge. And then this one I will cut off. So I'm lining mat line to mat line, cutting it off. Now I have another little scrap piece I can use for some detail on something later, agreeably, if you will. And then the bottom measurement was two and seven eighths. So I'm gonna measure two and seven eighths up here. I'm gonna line this up on the cutting mat. And I'm gonna measure two and seven eighths up here. Two and seven eighths. I'm gonna put that mark aligned with the mark on my cutting mat. Make sure the adjacent edge is perpendicular to the line on the mat. And then line up the lines on my mat so I don't have to measure twice. I believe I've said this now four times. There we go. So these sections should all fit equidistantly within these sections. I need to cut two more. So I'm gonna do the same thing again on this piece. And what I can do now is I can just use this as a template. And as long as I keep everything very, very tightly aligned, I should be able to just use it as a template. And do this. There's 
there's another greebly. And then if I turn that, make sure it stays aligned here. And cut that off. Another greebly. And then I can mark, line these up. I want all these to be parallel and perpendicular on the wall, so I'm just lining these up to each other. So again, I'm going to mark that, line this little markup on the mat. Hope this is making sense to you guys. I'm thinking and drafting right now. <clears throat> and then I'm gonna line out the ruler on the mat. that, score that, so those should be the same, and they are, and now I'm going to do this measurement up here, the center split should be pretty much bang on the center, line this up on the cutting mat, make sure the adjacent edge is perpendicular, or the intersecting edge I should say, I keep saying adjacent, I mean intersecting edge, it's perpendicular. Score this. And that should be my eight sections. They will equidistantly fit inside of all these when I cut them out. But I want them to be trim sections, so I'm now going to cut a section out of each of these. So, here's the fun part. <clears throat> I can measure this again, or I can just do this visually. I'm going to do it visually because I'm psycho and I want it to be about a quarter of an inch in so I'm going to literally just draw lines here as a reference that are all equidistant. You can measure these if you want, just for time's sake I'm not going to because at this scale I don't think the 32nd of an inch they're going to be off is going to be visually noticeable unless you're some kind of psychotic hyper OCD person. Who notices things like that now the trick is um no never mind it doesn't apply here i need to go a quarter of an inch <laughs> i was about to say something wrong never mind so i'm gonna do that here in the center too oh should just stay on this side oh no <laughs> i'm losing track of my lines here okay don't do that there's that. There's that one. This is basically how I would draw this in AutoCAD. Uh, well, old AutoCAD, new AutoCAD, you, there's faster ways, but old AutoCAD, you draw it like this and you trim out all the segments. So this is basically a layout and I need to cut out the innermost rectangles and remove them. And then I can cut fully on my break lines, and then I have my first layer of trim pieces, because I'd like to do two layers. We'll see what one looks like. One might be enough, but I'd like to do two. I might do a round over piece. I don't know. We'll, we'll see what it looks like. So now I'm going to just be a psychopath and cut these out without a ruler on the smaller side. Because believe it or not, it's actually easier for me. If I was using a ruler, I wouldn't be able to see clearly where these intersections of lines were. I trust myself enough to do it without a ruler. Don't cut with your finger in the way. And make sure you have a sharp blade. A dull blade might slip and you might cut yourself. And I am using my shoulder sort of as a fulcrum. And I'm only letting that be the only point that pulls and I'm letting my elbow just relax with my shoulder as I move it so my cut stays straight, if that makes sense. The shoulder joint is the fulcrum. And you can see I haven't cut all the way to the corner on the backside here, right? 
So now I'm just gonna go back and tighten up those corner cuts really quick. If you have a Cricut, you can do this on the Cricut. You have a laser cutter, you can do this on a laser cutter. But in my opinion, the time it would take to plot this out in Photoshop or on the Cricut or on AutoCAD or whatever the program you need to use as a DWG file, export it and have it cut out, I could have this done in the same amount of time. If it was more complex shape, then yeah, go ahead and use the Cricut or whatever. But um, for simple shapes like this, this typically works just fine. There we go. And I can use these for something because they're all going to be perfectly aligned. So I can use those as maybe a positive trim on another wall. So I'm going to save those. corners again. There we go. Now I have two little equal pieces again I can use for something. And since I cut these out, I don't want to be moving this around and accidentally break these or bend these. So I'm going to go ahead and cut this joint here that I scored earlier. I'm going to finish cutting the joint. Just a tip too for when you're cutting long skinny pieces of stuff, whether it's styrene or cardboard. Don't start at the top. Like if, you, if your finger point uh, of tension where you're holding it is far away from the cut line, which it should be. If you start at the top and push... The tension of the cutting and the pulling can actually make the piece bow outward and you take it away and it's not straight. So what I'll generally do is I'll score and then I'll start pushing down about a half inch or an inch into the cut and then cut down here. And then I have, and then I finish the cut back up here like I just kind of did. And then it won't bow away and bend because it actually can bend it. I've done that on styrene where I start here and I push hard the whole way. And I'm pulling here and pushing hard here, and it actually makes the whole thing bow. And then I'm like, oh, it's curved now. So I'll, I'll demonstrate again here in a minute. So here at this point, like instead of pushing hard here and cutting the whole way, I'm actually going to start pushing right about here. See how I'm about a quarter of an inch in? And now I'm going to cut and put the tension at the top where I'm pulling down from and see how it splits apart at the bottom. Now I'm going to go back and cut the top. And that is so that it doesn't bow out and it doesn't have a bend in it. It just, it, trust me, it will happen. So there is two little trim frames. And we got six more to do here. So I'll try to go through this kind of quick here. Do, 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 do. I'm always trying to keep the cutting line as far away from my body as possible. You notice how I rotated that piece just now? Just because if I was cutting like this really close to me, I, I might slip and hit my finger. So if you can do that, do that. Sometimes it's unavoidable. And if you need to get the roller out for safety or you're concerned, get the roller out for safety and use the ruler. But I see I'm like several inches away. So if, even if I slipped, it would just cut the piece. It wouldn't cut me. Work smarter, not harder. Work safer, not dumber. All right. I always like to demonstrate how to do everything, I poss if possible, by hand first. Because if you know how to do it by hand, you can usually figure out every other method. Meaning like... You know, instead of just showing you how to go straight to a laser cutter or a Cricut to do this, um, if you learn how to do it by hand, you can actually problem solve on the laser cutter or the Cricut sometimes. 
I, that's why I really like demonstrating how to do as much as possible with hands, without like advanced tools and even power tools, even hot knives. Like if you can do everything possible with a blade and a ruler, then the other tools will just be way easier and you'll know how to problem solve with those tools. So I like learning that way. I, it makes it makes me feel like I'm a little bit more well-rounded of a maker too myself. Like I'm not dependent upon the tool. I'm dependent upon only my imagination. So there's one that piece. And this one needs a few more little cuts. Right, almost there. Oh, that one didn't get cut as nearly as well as I thought. There we go. Okay. Set those aside. Again, I'm not going to cut from here. I'm going to start a little bit low. I'm going to put my finger up here and then I'm going to cut like that. And then I'm going to finish the cut up here. There we go. Your window to happiness. All right, draw my crazy lines here for reference. I promise this will go fast after this. This is just everything has got a little bit of a tedious thing you have to do, and then all of a sudden it all fits together magically, and you're like, oh. <laughs> so hang in there for me. I do so much cutting of measurements that are about an inch or smaller. I trust my eyes with this. Um, that's why I know I'm right around a quarter of an inch, give or take a 32nd of an inch. Um, and I'm not worried about any, anything bigger than a 32nd of an inch, like a 16th of an inch deviation from side to side, like from this side to that side, if I was off by 16th of an inch, it would be noticeable. But any less than that, I'm not worried about it. And you can see all those center points I drew, like how equidistant those all are. That's all practice and drawing and drafting and dealing with a lot of measurements under one inch. On a regular basis, you just get used to what an eighth, a quarter, three eighths, half an inch, five eighths, three quarters, seven eighths, and one inch looks like. You just get used to it, you know. <clears throat> so again, if you don't trust yourself to do that, great. But honestly, if you do it, the more you do it, the faster you'll get at it. <clears throat> so here we go. Oops. Cut a little deep on that one. Clean up those corners. There we go. Clean up the corners. The, one of the ways in which uh, the uh, laser cutter or the Cricut would come in super handy is if you needed to do like 30 of these walls. <laughs> you know, I'm just doing one. So by hand is totally fine. But if I had to do like 30 of these, which I may get to that point someday where I'm doing a whole house or I want to sell pre-made walls or something like that, which I'll probably do at some point, um, that's where a laser cutter or a cricket will be very, very handy. So.
Oh, well, that one pulled away. Okay. I cut a little too deep on the first score on that one. That's okay. This is also a really good way to make windows. It's my wind miniature windows tutorial. I kind of do the same basic thing here. Same principle also for cutting any type of linear feature that just needs to be raised or indented. This method works great. It works great for storefront windows, for doors, for signs, for miniature cardboard boxes, for ultimate cutting championship matches, if that's a thing that exists somewhere, I don't know. Almost there. Almost there. I don't want to push it out because I feel like I'm going to get a burr or it's going to tear. I can feel it wanting to let go though. There we go. Cut this one again, not at the top, from right there. Cut this. Boop. There's that. There's that. I see you guys commenting. I'll check the comments in a sec. I just want to get through this. <clears throat> And there's that cut. That cut. One of the things you learn in cooking is if you cook or cut with dull blades, you're actually more likely to cut yourself with a dull blade. Um, the only way you cut yourself with a sharp blade is if you're just not looking or you just put your blade in the wrong place. But if you have a good blade placement, you can have good blade placement and still cut yourself with a dull blade because it can slip, because it catches or gets stuck and then you pull too hard and it slips and cuts. So even if you're doing this with, if you're doing this with a sharp blade, you're more likely to have success and not hurt yourself. And a dull blade will also tear this material and have a less clean edge. So that's just why it really pays to do this with sharp blades and not be scared, but practice, be careful. And right here. Boom. Okay. Duffman's here, what's up? Duffman Diorama's here. Show you what I mean. Okay. So now, if I place these equidistant inside my reference lines, I can create trim or raised trim features, or at least the base layer of raised trim features, depending on what we're going for. Boom. Now we have very subtle base layer raised trim features. So that's gonna raise up about a sixteenth of an inch. So now we can we can put this down and it's gonna be like flat trim. We can cut another one that's a little bit smaller on the outside edge and the inside edge and do that. Or we could get creative with wood, strips of wood. We could cut flat linear pieces and cut 45s now that we have a, a grid laid out already for us. There's a lot of ways you could do this. Um, another way you that I was thinking about trying, I don't know if I wanna do it on this one, but taking on, round dowel rod and splitting it down the center. <clears throat> so I don't know if I have time to do it on this one, but if you take, you can, if you're careful, you can split this dowel rod down the center I can find my cut. There it is. But this takes a whole nother level of patience. 
yeah, I already messed it up, but <clears throat> you can split it down the center and create a round over piece and you can cut 45s and have round over trim. And to be honest with you, you could just 3D print these, but then you have resolution lines and then somebody like me would be like, ah, I can tell that it's 3D printed and I would go crazy. You can also cut off pieces from a piece of wood like this, which I also might do where you can just shave off a piece. Oops, that piece was a little rough. Like that, just give you a little piece of piece and then you can cut off raised trim pieces to go in the center, cut your little 45s or mark them with the pencil and do that. There's about a million things you can do to add the second layer if you wanna add a second layer or you can leave it the way it is. So first things first though, I'm gonna go ahead and just glue these down. I'll probably cut strips off of the same material and glue those down. It's probably what I'll end up doing because I think it's gonna be the most straightforward. But now, for the glue up, I'm going to move these over and then I'm gonna trace. Do I wanna trace or do I just wanna glue? I think I just wanna glue them. I was thinking about tracing them to keep them aligned, but I'm just gonna glue them down. I don't think I need to trace it. I'm gonna use my EPS glue for this. Wood glue would make this curl up way too much. And this is a non-water-based glue, it'll work better just going to spread glue evenly on the back side of all these comic book backer boards, poster board, whatever. Make sure that it's even, because it will matter on this. If it's not even when you paint it, the paint could make the edges of this curl up. Okay. And I'm just gonna press it down evenly all over. Make sure it's not gonna budge. Yep, I like it. Same thing here. I find sometimes in this case, it's easier to move the piece around than the glue. Make sure it's nice and even if it's too thin I do notice when if this glue is too thin um, it really doesn't glue at all it has to be actually fairly thickly on there if that's even a word fairly thickly There we go. It's so pretty. Okay. Six more times. Definitely too, because I've mentioned this before, but this MDF, it, don't use water-based paint, at least for the base layers. Use uh, like acrylic spray, acry or uh, not acrylic, latex or plastic or plasticine spray paint, um, whatever the other word is, just so that it doesn't warp the MDF and warp the board. Once you've layered like one or two layers of non-water-based paint down, especially if it's a spray paint on this, then you can add water-based paints if you like like a specific color or paint you wanna use, then you're safe. But if you add water-based paint at the beginning, it's gonna warp everything.
trying to minimize cleanup later. So the more you spread this out, the more it will stick down without squishing out, which is the opposite of what I was doing with the wooden glue earlier. And I'll have less to clean up. Just taking care to make sure all the pieces are lined up. Everything, oh, see we got clean up already over here. Don't want that. The best you can, the more you can do to minimize cleanup, if it's gonna be a difficult cleanup, the better. If it's an easy cleanup, like you just wipe, then who cares? But this, uh, this stuff, when it dries, it's pretty rock solid. And if it squishes out and dries, I have to come back with a knife and try not to cut this and mess this up and cut it away. And that's, that can get really frustrating. Do, 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 do. It is glue time, Troy, you're right. Oh, greetings from Hungary. Thanks for being here. What time is it in Hungary? Troy Dodson! Member for 22 months, thank you, sir. Um, warp is bad unless destruction you want. That sounds like a miniature making bumper sticker right there. Warp is bad unless destruction... Mm, warp is bad. I can't do Yoda's voice right now. Warp is bad unless destruction you want. That's like if force users were also diorama builders. That'd be a good what if. What if Yoda was a diorama maker? Use, use the toothpicks you must, I don't know. I can't think of anything clever right now. Vocal stimming. Okay. There we go. Two more. Por favor. Dun, dun, dun. Yippee. Spread pretty evenly. there I don't know why I feel like this wall needs to be teal a really nice teal color I don't know I don't have a nice teal though. I have like light blues baby blues sky blues turquoise like that 50s turquoise teal but that's a little too green I was thinking more like seafoam Seafoam teal, cyan teal, something like that. Okay, 
we have ourselves a sweet looking wall, I think. So that looks cool as is. You could leave it this way. But there's this is where you could really go in a lot of radically different directions, um, depending on period or what you want it to look like. You could leave it like this. That would look very modern. You could add a second layer of trim, whether it's square or rounded, will make a huge difference in the finished product. You could do uh, additional detail uh, pieces inside of these, uh, which would start to look more like almost French, uh, sort of treaty or Palace of Versailles looking stuff, like our Buckingham Palace, where they would do like decorative panel frames with like millwork and sculpture. So that's where you could do things like, let me show you. Um, you could, let's see if I can get my um, drawer on camera here for a second. Okay, this is where you could bring in like jewelry and beads, whoops, that's string, jewelry and beads and stuff, and add decorative elements if you wanted to get super duper pooper fancy. Um, stuff like that, glue stuff like that in the center, um, and then paint around it as like molding, decorative cast molding, uh, or sculptural looking molding. I'm trying to find something that looks a little bit more appropriate to what I'm thinking. I mean, stuff like this, but smaller, you know? This is like a big old uh, costume earring that I saved because I thought it would look cool on like a steampunk armband or like a middle of a sword hilt or something. Um, yeah, stuff like this, but smaller um, to look like decorative molding. Buttons are a great source. Um, so like these are like little decorative buttons. Uh, let's see. I have tons of other stuff. I just pulled that one drawer here. Well, you get the idea. But that is where you can get super duper creative and place them in the center here or down here paint it and have a very specific time period echoed or a style that looks uh, more realistic rather than just an emulated miniature theme, you know what I mean? So, yeah, you're right, Ricardo. Uh, I save a lot of miniatures, like visit your local bead shop or bead store and you'd be surprised what you can find there that would double as detail um, in all kinds of, in all kinds of stuff. Oh yeah, the Oregon plates, I found those, uh, in the dumpster. <laughs> I don't live in Oregon, I'm in Nevada, but, um, yeah, there's, I have California plates, Oregon plates, Nevada plates that I've found that I saved to make something out of someday. So. Okay, so this, uh, I, I do have to let this dry overnight before I paint it because this glue needs to off gas a little bit to fully cure, meaning it's gonna put off like a little bit of vapor. It's gonna be very little, but if I paint over this with like spray on paint, it's gonna create a sealed layer over it. It's not gonna let it off gas and it could mess up the paint or it could not bond very well um, and it could throw off the whole process and, or it could just take way too long for everything to cure. It could prevent the paint from curing uh, or it could take like, instead of the paint curing, in a couple of hours, uh, you know, or overnight, it might take four days for the paint to cure because this is putting off some kind of gas underneath the paint. So this, I need to let dry overnight before I paint it. Once I do, I will probably not paint it black. I will probably paint it, I don't know. I'll probably actually start with a, like a gray because uh, if I go with black, it's gonna make this wall look probably a lot darker than I want it to be. So, and I want this to look lighter. I want it to look like it's in a living room or something like that or a dining room. Um, so I'll probably paint it like a light gray or a medium gray and then put my color over it, whatever I decide if I want to go with green or a gray or a teal or a yellow or whatever. So um, go for it painting in Hungary. It's morning. It's 6 a.m. in Hungary. Well, thank you for having breakfast with us. All right, let me get that uh, rusty wall and we'll see if we can add some detail to that before we finish here. Bam. Oh, it's so pretty. It's so pretty. Okay. 
What was I going to do? Oh, yeah. Paints. <laughs> <laughs> These guys. I have two of the same color because one of them, I can't tell if it's dry or not, and one of them is pretty low. So we're going to go with the spiced berry first. And let me grab some silver. Actually, I might use some silver spray paint. I'll show you how. Bam. Just getting some water. Hold on one sec. Ladies and gentlemen from Hungary. do not know any Hungarian words, so I would say something, but I don't know what to say. <clears throat> Got a piece of a sponge here and just a brush I don't mind ruining. And we're going to go with some... Let's move this closer. Drop that down. We're going to put some spiced berry here in the middle. And we're going to go to town. I'm going to get the brush wet. And then I'm going to wipe it off. Just so that's soft. The paint doesn't immediately get hard on it. Go into this spiced berry and fill up the bristles. Spread it out. So that there's just some paint on there. I'm not going like for full dry brushing. But, you know, just some. Now I want to pick some areas. Um, and this is where I'm going to, like, literally stipple this on to make it have some texture and some lift. So I'm going to pick some areas where I want to be rusty and create some sort of directional rust. And you'll see what I mean here. And I will probably add and take away and add and take away and do all kinds of stuff. So it, it's like, it's going to seem a little clashy right now, but as I go, it will make sense. This just comes from lots of experimenting. I'm kind of going uh, uh, for the darker areas that are already darker to put some of this red in. You don't have to do that. I'm just kind of choosing to, just for now. And then I'm gonna kind of, some of these areas where it's a little smoother, I might just swipe this paint down to make it look like trickle down. off and go into the orange 
Where's my big towel? <clears throat> yep. And I'm gonna grab some brown too. I find uh, red, orange, and brown just are perfect for rust. So this is where I'll kind of combine all three or two colors. So I'm going to grab the orange and just stipple it. And it picks up a little bit of the red. And then I'm going to go back over those spots to create highlights. With a little too much paint. And again, you don't have to do it this way. It's just a stylized rust. I'm going for a stylized look because this is supposed to be an accent wall, you know? It all depends on how rusty you want it to look. You could not put any red in and get a totally different color. You could put not any brown in and get a totally different color. You don't have to put in any uh, orange uh, if you don't want to. You can even throw blue in there and get some interesting looking rusty stuff because of the way like metal heats up in certain environments and rusts. So you can get all kinds of cool stuff. And this is all gonna tone down too as it dries. So I'm just gonna kinda splotch it onto this edge too, strategically. And you're going to find probably some of the more raised areas will get brighter, just like normal highlights and stuff with any colors or any style of thing. So I'll go into some of the areas that are more raised and plop some little orange highlights where there's rust. Change viewing angles here. So I'm going to put a little bit of brown in this here. Get a little bit in the. I'm doing it on purpose so that it's like not smoothly mixed, so that when I when I um, tap down, I get a random smattering of brown and orange on purpose. And picking up brown and orange. Sometimes I'll pick up more brown than orange, sometimes more orange than brown, intentionally or unintentionally, and I just go with it. Whatever it does, I just kind of go with it. Something I'm going to do here too is I'm going to take um, <clears throat> I'm going to take another dry trip chip brush. If I can find one. And once I've finished with an area or I feel like I'm happy with it, I'm going to I'm going to swipe down with my dry chip brush to kind of tie everything together. You'll see what I mean here when I do it. Okay. You can even go up to, as long as it's all the same direction don't want curves in it because the curves will look like you painted it. There we go. So I'll show you the difference here in the two sides.
I always pour out way too much paint on my palette. Another reason I like using cheap paint. Because I tend to over over overestimate how much paint I need. Okay, same thing, get that dry brush. Those smear lines really look really cool with that dry brushing, like along here. Hard to see because the paint's still drying, but like that smear line, it looks. I love the way that looks. It's like a drip line that rusted. Like the water came down and settled and just kind of like dried there and then that edge rusted. I love the way that looks. Big fan of the drip line, drip line rust. All right, this is like pretty close to where I'm gonna be done with the orange and stuff. I'm just gonna kind of look over it and do a few more little additions if I feel like they're needed. Um, maybe just a couple little highlights with some bright orange and a couple little spots. And then I'll, again, I'll go back with my dry brush. So yeah, I'm just gonna kind of highlight with some orange and some spots. Almost there. This is very stylized rust, you know? It's not necessarily like battlefield rust like real battlefield rust is stylized so for me you know this has you may not want this for your piece so you know don't knock me if you don't like it but um you know it might not be the style of rust to do but again if you play with these tones and these colors more red less red more orange less orange no black, like gray base coat, orange base coat, you know, just messing with these tones and how to layer them, you'll find something you're happy with, I guarantee it. This is actually probably one of my favorite parts of painting is doing like this finished detail work because everything just starts looking cool. It's like, hey, maybe my idea didn't suck. <laughs> Once you start getting to where you want it to be. I can see there's some spots that need some more orange. Just gonna dry brush a little bit in here. So the same thing I'm doing with this weathering, uh, when I talked about balancing positive and negative space, bright and dark, heavy to light, corner to corner, I'm doing that with this color as well. As I'm highlighting this, I'm seeing where maybe this area looks too dark, like there's too much darkness over here, so I'm just gonna put some orange right here. And like over here, it's all too orange, and it's not bright enough, so I'm gonna add some highlight here. You know, right here, dark so I'm gonna add some highlights on top just to kind of create some symmetry some symmetry that you can't tell is symmetry you know what I mean so I'll go over the piece with color and highlight and do the same thing and keep painting because as it dries everything's gonna dull up a little so I'm just gonna I'm going back even over the places I just went and adding some more, because I'm like, yeah, that needs a little bit more. Almost there. And 
And a lot of my colors are following that shading that I created when I did the sort of highlights at the beginning and lowlights where I created shadows with the black I already did. And when I layered the brown over it, then I layered the red over it, I created natural areas of darker and lighter spots. And so the spots that are lighter as a result of that, that's where I'm adding more highlight. And the sparse that are darker is where I'm trying to de-emphasize highlight. So it all works and there's, it creates this real depth to the color, almost like there's a, like a really nice lens and a director of photography that's chosen intentionally to light something a certain way, but you're getting it without the lighting, you're getting it in the actual paint itself. Pretty happy with the way that looks. Rusty goodness. All right, now I'm going to use some spray paint to do a couple of little silver highlights. And this is where it gets tricky. So I'm going to use a, a filbert brush or a flat edge brush that's fairly thin that I don't mind ruining. Or actually, if, you, if I put it right back in the water, it'll still work but I'm gonna just spray this off to the side onto a piece of cardboard. So I create a little puddle of silver. And I'm gonna very quickly just kind of do some highlights with it. So I'm literally just going to spray onto this piece of cardboard a puddle of silver. up on this brush and just like this and smear with my finger just in a couple spots And part of the reason I'm smearing with my finger too is it dulls it up. Um, it actually takes away some of that shininess and dulls it up to kind of fit with the piece. And there's one last layer we do after this too. You don't actually can stop at the layer I just did too if you like the way that looks, uh, which I did. I just trying to kind of show off a little bit more technique here for you. my camera over. So again, edges that would get scraped up on by somebody walking by or machinery. Maybe somebody had to adjust something, you know, whatever. And I'm kind of doing it on the, trying to do it in the places where there's an, it's an edge 
for where there's the most orange. Like it had just recently been um, scraped. Troy, I'm glad you like it. <laughs> Don't recommend smearing spray paint with your finger, but it's the best technique I know to do it. <laughs> you could put a glove on and do it, but it wouldn't have the same effect. Uh, and you can, you don't have to do this either. You can, you can dull it by doing a wash over it. I just like having control over those little things when I can. here from this angle and then we'll probably call it good little tank tip too is as the paint dries on your brush you can smear more and it won't create like solid lines but it will create um, like faded metal like I just did right here so like check this out it's kind of hard to see on camera but there's a very subtle faded metal look now like that it's almost like using the rub and buff stuff but you can do it with your brush as that um, spray paint dries. A lot of these techniques, again, I just discovered while trying to paint as a kid. You know, not knowing how this stuff worked, I just kind of figured it out. So which is why I encourage people to just experiment. A lot of stuff you will just figure out. <laughs> that How do I do that? How do I do that? Just start messing around. You will be surprised how much that you just figure out. You will, people, you know, you don't have to be special. You'll just... You will just figure it out. Just, you just gotta give it a shot. Just gotta start doing things. Also gotta learn to not overdo it too. Overdoing it can be a mistake. So it's something that you can easily run into is the tendency to overdo it. So I'm just trying to not overdo it right now. But I think I'm doing okay so far. Oh, that's pretty happy. Troy, you're right. You can make a mess or a masterpiece, totally. But honestly, making those messes is where you learn. So I've, I have made plenty of crappy looking rusty things, <laughs> to be honest. So, And I'm not going to go down here with, with highlights because I want there to be sort of a natural shadow at the bottom because I'm going to have a floor here. So really like the way that turned out. And now I'm going to do just a, a light wash over it. So let me get... A little bit of black paint. I'm going to just keep it very light though because I like the way this looks as it is. I don't want to do too dark of a wash otherwise it could delete some of the stuff I just did. <clears throat> Hold on. Just put some stuff away before I forget. some water I was going to use the sponge but it just it didn't seem to be necessary so it does work kind of in any orientation huh I didn't really mean for that but that's what happened 
Okay. Okay. Now I'm just going to take a brush here, a big chip brush. I just put a little bit of black paint in this water here. And I'm just going to, actually, let me get um, paper towels under this so I don't mess up my table. So this is what you get when you rub that silver spray paint with your finger, this little like gathering of latex silver spray paint. So yes, it's toxic. I have calluses, I play guitar, I've got glue on my fingers from earlier. I don't really recommend it, but you know, paint at your own risk. Okay. All right, I just got some black paint water here and I'm just gonna, I don't want this to soak into the MDF either, so I'm just gonna go lightly. Right there but that's okay this is just to kind of tie everything together with atmospherics I'm just gonna do this and then I'm gonna tip it up and wipe it all down and try not to get it up here on the MDF too much it's mostly exposed and not too much on the cardboard because it will peel but there is like a bunch of layers of paint on here, so it should be okay, but just in case. And then we do this, whoops, let me get the camera so you guys can see the effect. We do that. And we let it, just gonna wipe up this excess drip. I'm gonna kind of pat it down. I don't, again, I don't want it to warp anything here because we're dealing with some softer materials, but I do want the effect of it. So, just gonna let it soak up some of it. Pretty good. I like it. I love it when stuff turns out better than I meant for it to. Still got it in me. Yay. I always get nervous when I do something I haven't done in a long time that I'm just going to do it wrong or bad. I haven't really done a rusty thing in a long time, so it's been quite a while. So... I was like, hopefully I don't look like a buffoon by the time I'm done here. But I still got it in me. Thank the diorama gods. Sweet! There it is. And that's that layer of black wash makes it rich. It adds a richness to it. So this like type this whole painting effect could be done on the outside of a vehicle, on a rusty battlefield, inside of a ship. Whether it's a spaceship or a sunken ship underwater, like this can work for a lot of different things. At weathering a dumpster, I'm using the same basic techniques that I use to weather my hyper real miniature dumpsters that I sell. Obviously, I don't do the whole thing like that typically. I'll do corners and edges, the inside, bottom, and the base. That's what I'll do with this. Um, but uh, it's the same techniques that that I that I use on my dumpsters here. So you're not. You're not getting anything different than that, and it's the same principles as well. I do want to make sure there isn't any big droplets of water that are going to dry, because when that, those dry, those are pretty obvious that they were big drops of water, and that can ruin the scale look of it. Yep, that looks good. Okay... There it is, it's a rusty wall, oops, there it is, it's a rusty wall. 
Looks good. All right. Let me um, do this here. So we made this wall. We pulled the one, two, three blocks off this other wall here. I think we're five walls in with two painted. Let me see, is this dry enough for me to sand? Yeah, maybe. So pull these one, two, three blocks off because this wood glue should be cured enough to do what I need. Okay. There's that wall. Right? Probably, I think I could, eh, I probably should let this dry overnight before I base coat it because I'm going to sand it too. There's some little raised little bumps edges right here. So I'll let this dry overnight, let the glue dry overnight, and then I'll sand it. I'll trim up all these edges nice and clean, base coat it with something light colored and paint it a nice color. Um, and then this one I'm going to probably, let's see, this glue is, that's dry enough to unclamp. Let's see what it looks like unclamped. Hopefully I didn't glue the clamp piece down to it. It oh, I kind of did. Dang it. Uh, that's what I, oh, oh, we're okay. Okay. Cool. All right. A little bit seep through right there and right there, but I can clean that up with my knife the same way that I cut it. So there's this wall. So put my clamps over there. We got one wall. We got two walls. Three walls. We got four walls. We got narwhals. We got five walls. And yeah, so I don't know if I'm going to come back on exactly next week or two weeks from now, but I need to make at least eight walls. So I need to make one, one, two, three, four. What do I have? <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, five. When I finish those, I'll have five. I'd like to make three more because I want to do two rows of four and then the bottom layer is going to be brick and cinder block, which you've already seen me do. Um, and then I'm going to do brick and cinder block on the bottom and the base is going to be street. So it's like you're looking into individual apartments. The bottom floor is going to be the street and then I'm going to light everything and build the, the shelf for it. So I have to figure out if I want to work on the shelf or if I want to do more walls or what, but either it'll either be next week or the week after that it'll do another stream. And uh, I'll probably build some of the shelving off camera uh, and then show you how it goes together on cameras because I don't really know how to do big sheet plywood work with the camera right now. I'm not really set up for that. I'm set up on this table here. So, um, but that's what I'll probably have to do. And I'm going to do some more. This is probably the most dramatic wall I'm going to do, but I'm going to do other stuff um, that is more like these accent walls. I have some other ideas uh with some stained walnut on dark charcoal gray wall but i have to pre-stain some of the wood before i glue it down to do it right so i might have to start that one off camera and just explain it um on camera nothing special about it it's just the process it's gonna take uh making a bunch of pieces separately letting them dry overnight i can assemble it on camera and glue it together but um trying to sand all the pieces and stain them on camera is going to be very boring it's going to be like three hours of me sanding little sticks and probably not knowing what to talk about while I'm doing it. Um, so, what did I say I wanted to do? I think that was it, right? <laughs> oh, sand this. Let me see. I think I can sand this lightly. I think we're safe. Um, I wanted to just see if I could get some of the color that I put under it to show through. If not, that's okay. Let me get my hydrate sandpaper. This is 800 grit, and I'm just gonna kind of bend it and just go over some of the edges here and see see what it does. What is up, Eduardo? Yeah, it's popping a little bit. It's hard to see on camera because of the sheen of the paint. So, hold on a sec. Let me just go around and do the edges really quick. See if I can show you guys.
Yeah, okay, it's doing what I want. It's very subtle though, This the way this sheen is, it's, it's reflecting a lot of light back into the camera. Let me do this and then I'll hold it up to the camera. Trying to create highlights without painting them. Have them occur naturally in the finish of the wood. I'm using 800 grit so that it pulls off very thin layers of paint. If I went with like 120 grit, it would just it could just grind it right back down to the wood. And then I have to start all over again, and I don't want to do that. Probably go back over this with a matte clear coat once this paint cures more. But can you guys see the little highlight edges that I created? So I sanded in here, so we've got variation of black and blue. And then on the edges there, there's like a, a bright blue highlight. That's the paint underneath. And then there's like, it almost looks like it's like sort of very subtly glowing. That's how I layered the paint. To look almost like like it's glowing a little bit again the sheen there you go you can kind of see it at that angle a little bit it sort of looks like glowing um so and then you can see some of my scrape marks here the sandpaper so to, to eliminate those scrape marks um i will spray this with a matte clear coat um when it's all dry so that it will even itself back out and those scrape marks will disappear but not the variations created from them so that is my wall my glowy wall it's so pretty yay okay <laughs> cool uh thank you guys for joining me um for making or for making these walls what are we we're like a little over six hours in and i've got almost five walls done so that's what an hour and a half per wall that's not bad for nice looking walls for a display so if we're at an hour and a half per wall for eight walls plus i'm going to do the bottom so that's really 12 walls I'm gonna be in like 20 hours into this display, but I'm trying to make it a lesson uh, teaching thing for you guys so that it doubles as content for you guys as well as getting something done for me that I need to get done. So I hope it was worth it. Um, I think I'm gonna clip this uh, orange rusty wall up into its own video down the road for people uh, as a separate video because I think that would be worth it for folks as well as some of these other walls. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Please take care of each other. If you're still watching in Hungary, I hope you have a great day watching the future times leave a comment below tell me what you liked or didn't like tell me how stupid you think i am 
tell me what your favorite color is and why I should like it uh, more than I do. Um, you guys rock. Thank you so much for your patience with me. Thank you for putting up with me. And uh, I'll see you later. Have a good night.